Okay guys and girls, wanna welcome you to a new video and in this video I wanna review the cards of the new set coming out, Wilds of a Drain is the name of the new set. Uh, I only wanna discuss the rares and the mythics in the set because I think that's yeah the most important things for most players where they uh, should spend or um, their white uh, their rares and mythic wild cards because um, the common and uncommon uh, wild cards aren't that hard to get and yeah I guess uh, the rares and the mythics is all that matters or mostly that matters so I just want to discuss that maybe I will a future video where I discuss the common and uncommon um, cards and review them but for this video I just want to discuss the rares and the mythics and I wanna only um, do it yeah for standard um, because it would uh, the video would be way too long if I discuss um, how good uh, every card would be in for example alchemy historic historic brawl so just will make maybe some notes but we'll basically discuss this for standard okay. So let's get in for the first card we want to review, and that's Agada of the Wild Cauldron. So Agada is a human warlock for two colors in Gruel for 1-1, one, one, and activate abilities of creatures you control cost X less to activate, where X is Agada of the Wild Cauldron's power. This effect can't reduce the mana in that cost to less than one mana. And other creatures you control get plus one plus one and gain trample and haste until the end of turn as an active ability for six mana. Okay, so what can you do uh, or how can you make the most use out of uh, Agada? So I'm not super excited about Agada. So the cost reduction is kind of nice, but I don't see a way in standard where you really super benefit from it so i guess the uh, most common activate abilities are the transform abilities uh, for example the praetors or we have some transform um, creatures from the what is it much of the machine sets but all in all um, i don't think this is a super huge card so i would rate it on a scale uh from one to ten and i give it a five because i don't think it will uh, impact the standard matter yeah super much so what cards do we have that really benefit from n so besides the praetors there we have a Thran Spider for the active ability to grab an artifact, but we also have the Ulvenwald Oddity, buffs other creatures. Mm. So, in my opinion, um, there are better ways to spare it on Mystic, uh, Mystic Rare. So, for me, um, I personally wouldn't spend any wild card on it. Maybe there is a hidden combo in historic or otherwise. So I would rate this just a, fair, a five out of 10. And I wouldn't advise you to spend a wild card on it. Uh, but if you wanna try out and make a combo deck out of it, maybe there is any way. I can't imagine for now, but maybe there is a way in historic on other formats so if this is the case then sure go for it grab a couple of it but in for standard i don't see that this will uh yeah we will be seen very often in the meta okay coming to the next card now it's the agatha soul cauldron so a legendary artifact for two mana music and you may spend mana as so it were mana of any color to activate abilities of creatures you control. Creatures you control with a plus one plus one counter on them have all activate abilities of all creature cards exiled with Agatha's Soul Cauldron. And 
The active ability Exile Target Card from a Graveyard. When a creature card is exiled this way, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. So okay, the so best use of this card is in combination with Agada. So what could be a possible way to play this card? So if you have Agada and Agada Soul Cauldron out, um Creatures you control with a plus one plus one counter have all um, activated abilities of creature cards except uh, um, Agada's Soul Cauldron. So, for example, you manage somehow to have another Aga a copy of Agada, uh, I mean the creature in the graveyard, you can exile them, and then all creatures you have with a plus one plus one counter have the ability of Agada that reduces the cost. So this would make, could get into your huge cost reduction of active abilities. But uh, yeah, like you heard, it's many ifs. So I don't see an easy way to apply a combo here. Maybe like, um, like I said to Agada, maybe there is a way in, yeah, historic brawl or historic to apply a, Nasty combo with it, but yeah, for standard, I don't see any way you can really benefit from the this or um, the Agada creature, really. So uh, I would personally just rate it a 5 out of 10, because maybe there is a certain way um, I uh, looked a lot uh, for... Um, for maybe a combo, but I didn't really find one. So yeah, maybe a four or five, I would rate it. And personally, I wouldn't spend any wild card on it. So the next card is the Archon of the Wild Rose. So for four mana and mono white colors, you get a Archon flying four for a creature and other creatures you control that are enchanted by auras you control have base power and toughness plus four plus four and have flying so this is kind of a nice card um because we have the new mechanic of the rolls uh, roll tokens uh, roll tokens are enchantments and uh yeah uh, aura enchantments and basically um there are a few uh, cards out there in the new set where you can enchant your creatures in an easy way and yeah this card buffs them all to basically four five uh four four flying angels so this card is yeah pretty cool so i would definitely rate this uh seven out of ten so yeah can definitely play it if you into aura so i really would recommend it so I personally would spend two to three uh, wild cards if you wanna, yeah, play an enchantment or aura deck. So yeah, really good card. So next card, we have the only planeswalker for the Wilds of the Drain set, Ashiok, the Wicked Manipulator. For five mana, you get the legendary Ashiok. And if you would pay life, while your library has at least that many cards in it, excited that many cards from top of your library instead. Then Ashok has the plus one ability. Look at the top two cards of your library, excite one of them and put the other into your hand. So this is a, yeah, a super good uh, value ability. So basically digs two cards deep into your deck and you choose the one you would like and you can play them. So Pretty cool. Then the minus two ability, create two. One one black nightmare creature tokens with at the beginning of your combat of your turn. If a card was put into exile this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. But this triggers only once, I guess. So no matter how many exile ca uh, cards, um, were exiled, you just get a one plus one plus one. But because you make two creature tokens, it's pretty good and can, you can protect the Asher pretty good. And then we have the target player access the top X cards of the library, where X is the total mana value of cards you own into exile. 
so this is also a super huge yeah uh, minus ability so if you have exiled a couple of really expensive cards you can mill the opponent yeah pretty yeah uh, in a pretty a pretty hefty way so maybe um, mill decks will uh, make a comeback with ash York, the wicked Man manipulator but yeah i really like this planeswalker um just the plus ability alone is pretty huge uh you really get a ton of value out of it the minus two ability is also cool and yeah so i'm not sure about uh pay life ability um i looked all the cards from the current standard sets but there aren't that many ways where you can pay life so actively, um, so maybe Azure is even better in historic than in standard because if you can pay, I don't know, um, um, I'm, I mean, in historic, there are certain cards where you can play, um, yeah, a lot of life and then you can exile really, um, many cards with it. So this, yeah, can get out of hand pretty nice. So yeah, Ashok is pretty versatile for a planeswalker. So I would rate uh, Ashok personally uh, eight point five. So one of the bomb cards you definitely want to get. So because it is a planeswalker and it's it is yeah five mana, not that easy in most cases. So I personally would spend two or three white cards on it. But definitely, uh, Ashok definitely a force that, yeah, opponents will fear. So, yeah, we'll definitely see this card uh, a lot in the, yeah, meta, I guess. Okay, next card is the uh, S9 at Antics. So it's um, Mystic Sorcery for four mana. And you may cast um, S9 uh, Antics as though it had Flash if you pay two more to cast, but then, um, then it costs six, so pretty pricey. And the real effect, for each creature your opponent control, create a cursed roll token attached to the creature. So um, this means that every creature the opponent has uh, will get a cursed roll token, and uh, the cursed roll token transforms uh, the enchanted creature to a uh, one one. They will uh, still have their ability, so uh, one one shattered will still have their drain ability. But uh, yeah, it's kind of nice to transform all their creatures in, into basically some rats. So this is kind of nice. So I guess you could combine this. Um, in a control style deck, um, a really good card, uh, maybe for this, uh, in addition to this, would be the Night Clubber. So, the Night Clubber, uh, the creature with the Blitz ability, and when enters the battlefield, all creatures get minus one, minus one, and so basically, you would have a board wipe. So, that would be kind of cool. So, this card is pretty solid, uh, in my opinion. And pretty versatile because you can play it as a sorcery and an instance. So I would rate it a 7.5 out of 10. And if you like control legs, um, I would personally spend two or three copies of it. So yeah, pretty good card. So definitely a good choice to spend your wild cards on. Okay, the next one is a tale for the ages. So it's enchantment, enchanted creatures you control get plus two, plus two. So basically just buffs your enchanted creatures. So I guess the best way to play this card is in a row seam deck. So there are a couple of cards in this format where you can create, um, yeah, your roll tokens and all your roll tokens get buffed. So this is a kind of, yeah, nice little card addition, would I, would I would say. Also, it's just a rare. So 
if you wanna make a token or a roll token seam deck, um, yeah, this is a kind of good filler. Personally, um, if you are into these kind of decks, I would, yeah, maybe, yeah, spend two to three um, wild cards on it. Kind of nice addition to a roll seam deck. So the next card we want to discuss is Balloona Grand Squall. So uh, for three mana and Temu colors, you get the legendary Giant Noble. Uh, also has an adventure. So let's discuss the creature first. It's a Trample Giant Noble um, for three mana for four and permanent spells you cast that have an adventure cost um, cost one less to cast. So gives a discount for all your um, adventure creatures uh, and enchantments basically. And then the Lunar Grand Squad has the Adventure Instant for 5 mana and Temo colors, mill 7 cards, then put all cards uh, that have an Adventure uh, on it uh, among the milled cards into your hand. So, and I guess in a mill style uh, deck, you would probably get uh, at least, you should get three cards, uh, three Adventure cards, so pretty kind of cool. Um, the awkward thing about this card is that, yeah, you basically uh, want to get the Lunar Grand Scroll um, uh, as early out as you can to get to benefit from the discount. But on the other hand, you want to get value from the instant adventure. So this is kind of awkward for its alone. So, yeah. Not super sure about this. Um, the discount is really nice. The ability is kind of nice, but it's awkward that, yeah, you, sh yeah, that uh, it isn't other around um, because you wanted the discount as fast as you can. And the six rules is kind of expensive. But yeah, um, adventure is all over the sets. So if you want to play adventure set, um, and yeah, you want to stick to these colors. I would rate this card a 6.5 out of 10. And yeah, if I would play it, I would at least spend two wild cards on it. Yeah, I think two wild cards is pretty good on this one. Okay, then the next card we want to discuss is the Besiege the Mirror. So for four mana, you get um, basically a tutor spell, sorcery speed. It is a mythic. It has bargain. So you can sacrifice an artifact, enchantment, a token as you cast the spell. So you will search for any card you want, exile it face down, then shuffle. And if the spell was bargained, you may cast the exiled a card without paying its mana cost if that spell's mana value is four or less. And then put the Excite uh, card into your hand if it wasn't cast this way. So, yeah, um, it is an expensive tutor effect, not gonna lie. The ability to bargain is kind of nice. If you're really looking for anything that has value for or less, then it is pretty good. Um, for just a tutor spell for four mana, it is kind of expensive, not gonna lie. So to really have a benefit, uh, to get the benefit from it, you should cast it with the bargain. Um, a nice little way to bargain would be, for example, the Spiteful Hexmage. So the Spiteful Hexmage is um, Human Warlock, is a 3-2 for one, but um, you have to make a cursed roll token and this cursed roll token uh, will transform one of your creatures into a 1-1. One -one. So with this uh, would be, for example, uh, example um, a good target for the bargain. You uh, bargain the uh, cursed roll token and then you could toot off for um, yeah some stuff, but you really get the value out of it just if you search for anything that has four or less value. And um, yeah, if you need a board wipe, this can 
we kind of good can uh, search for and um, pass of para or other stuff so this card is yeah not bad but also not too strong i would personally rate it five out of ten and um, i wouldn't spend um just one wild card um if you like tutor spells so yeah don't have to spend uh, have to spend a wild card on, uh, on it in my opinion but if you liked Tutor Spurs in general, maybe you can give it one, um, yeah, one wild card. Okay, now we have the bl uh, Blossoming Tortoise. So when it enters the battlefield or attacks, mill three cards. Then return a land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Um, so it basically ramps you when it enters the battlefield or uh, attacks. So pretty nice. And then activated abilities of lands you control cost one less to cast. And uh, land creatures you control get plus one plus one. So yeah, uh, pretty much text on the card. Um, pretty good value for four mana. The 3-3 three -three body is kind of nice, but the first ability I guess is the most important. So you can ramp pretty good. So you will definitely get a trigger from the ETB effect, but if you can manage to attack for a few turns, yeah, you will definitely ramp in a good way. So this is really a kind of nice card. So I really like it. Uh, this has definitely some play in a various couple of decks. So I really like it. And uh, I would say, I would personally rate it a seven out of 10. Um, so the land creature buffs is also kind of nice, but in current standard, there aren't that many land creatures. The only way I can think of is awaken the woods. So if you create um, a couple of, I don't know, uh, land creatures, then they will all get buffed. So pretty nice to have. Yeah. So I would say a seven out of 10 and yeah, definitely can spend I guess two wild cards on it, so definitely kind of nice to ramble this little creature. Okay, and now we're talking about ramble familiar. So for two mana in green color, you get the elemental raccoon with the adventure and the creature has tap it for one green mana and tap it for two mana. And discard a card, return bramble familiar to its owner's hand. So this is a, a kind of sweet card, so you can ramp and you can return it to its owner's hand. So reminds me of Shigeki. So, and uh, Adventure Sorcery is the fetch quest. For seven mana, you mill seven cards, then put a creature, enchantment, or land card from among the mill cards onto the battlefield. So this is, uh, yeah, kind of cool. Because, uh, yeah, I guess this is a hit or miss. Uh, so it depends what you are milling. Um, can get a huge creature out of it. But seven mana is pretty, yeah, expensive. Not gonna lie, but with um, the Bramble Familiar's ability to discard a card and return a Bramble Familiar, do, you basically can, um, yeah, Cast the sorcery adventure, um, yeah, a couple of times. So this is pretty cool. So I personally would rate this uh, 7.5 uh, out of 10. Uh, it definitely will have a lot of play in the adventure, adventure style deck. Um, how many wild cards would I spend? Um, so if I would go uh, play the element, uh, adventure um, themed uh, deck, then I definitely uh, definitely would include a couple of these. So uh, I guess you will not do anything wrong if you spend two or three wild cards on the Bramble Familiar. Okay, guys and girls, now talking about the Charming Scoundrel. So a human rogue for two mana. Uh, it is a rare, has haste, is a 1-1, and has the ETB ability 
to choose between three modes, discard a card, then draw a card, create a treasure token, or create a wicked roll token attached to target creature you control. The wicked roll token is just an aura attached to one of your creature. And it just basically says that um, opponent will lose one life if this creature or this aura goes to the graveyard. So not super impactful, but if you, yeah, have a sacrifice deck or want to sacrifice some stuff, you can um, sacrifice this wicked roll token. So yeah, this card is pretty versatile, not gonna lie. Uh, but also not super um, impactful, um, but I would rate it, I guess, a 5 out of 10. So the versatility I really like. So I guess this can't fit in a lot of decks. But uh, on the other hand, it doesn't have a super uh, impact on the battlefield. So personally, um, I wouldn't spend any wild cards on it. Just if I need uh, this kind of versatile creature in my deck, if it really fits that role, then maybe, yeah, you can uh, put some copies in it. Then I would spend more. But um, yeah, for now, I wouldn't spend any wild cards on it. Okay, here is the cruel uh, Sumner Phage. So this is a nightmare creature for two uh, mana. And uh, it is an adventure card. Um, it is a rare. And the cruel uh, Sumner Fates power and toughness are equal to the number of creature cards in all uh, graveyards. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so I guess this card makes the most sense in, yeah, in kind of a self mill deck. Self mill or, um, yeah, real mill deck. Then it also has the sorcery adventure for two mana uh, in blue color. Then uh, target player miss for cards. So you can either choose yourself or the opponent. So, um, yeah, kind of interesting choice. Um, you can't really play this on the early turns if you haven't milled um, yourself or your opponent. So beware of that. Um, yeah, but in I guess in the mill deck it really would make some sense. So definitely a cool creature. Um, could also play, yeah, uh, see uh, play in a self mill deck. Maybe a Sultai self mill deck would also benefit from this card. So I personally um, would give this card a seven out of ten. I really like the card. Would make a good blocker if there are many creatures in uh, all graveyards. The sweet little thing about this card is it says that all gra uh, graveyards. So also in a removal heavy deck, you yeah you have a nice little uh, value out of it because um, if you shoot for um, I guess some creatures uh, of the opponent, it yeah it has a good size. So yeah, kind of like this card. So if you want to go and try out a uh, mill deck, um, yeah, feel free to include a couple of uh, these bad boys in your deck. So I definitely would, yeah, um, spend two or three if I want to go, um, if you, yeah, if you want to build a self mill or just a, a, a mill deck. So yeah. Okay. Ariat of the Charmed Apple. Uh, three mana in all of colors for a legendary human warlock has a two for body and the first ability is each creature that is that's enchanted by an aura you control can't attack you or planeswalkers you control and at the beginning of your answer each opponent loses x life and you gain x life x is the number of auras you control so this is a pretty interesting card so, Ariad is kind of cool in an aura themed deck. So, um, every uh, aura you can cast on a creature uh, the opponent controls uh, can't attack you anymore. So, this is pretty good. So, if you can, yeah, 
um, play, for example, a roll token. Uh, I guess it is the cursed roll token. Then it transforms your uh, the creature your opponent's control into a 1-1. One -one, and they can't, can't attack you or planeswalker you control. So this is pretty good. But also, um, if you had a, have a lot of auras out, then you can uh, yeah drain your opponent uh, in a really efficient way. So I really kind of like this card. So I would definitely say this card is a 7 out of 10. So yeah. Um, also not easy to kill for mono red. So this is kind of good. So this can really, um, yeah, give you the life you need to survive. So yeah, personally would spend, I guess, two to three wild cards on that. Definitely a cool card. Okay, here's the Decadent Dragon. For four mana, you get a four for Flying Trample Dragon. This alone is pretty good. But it also have whenever the dragon attacks, create a treasure token. So... Yeah, similar to the Fable token, would be nice if this uh, one uh, would have haste rather of trample, but it is what it is. So I really like um, the creature type of this adventure card, but it also has an adventure and this is the expensive taste. It is an instant adventure and for three mana in... Um, Black colors, uh, you excite the top two cards of target opponent's rivalry face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain excited. You also basically uh, steal two cards of the opponent's uh, deck, so that is pretty cool. So um, the downside of this uh, instant adventure is that um, it just says uh, you can cast it, but not... Uh, cast um, with any mana uh, uh, you could cast so you have to watch out um, because you uh, don't have uh, in most cases the mana uh, of the um, yeah of opponent's colors so you basically rely on your dragon to make the most use out of it if um, your opponent plays other colors than you but I really, really like this card. I think it's really super impactful. Um, the adventure itself is pretty good. The dragon is uh, pretty good. So both on their own are, yeah, really good. But uh, combined to, uh, together, you have a really powerful card. So yeah, I guess you will see um, this card very often in the meta in yeah, Rakdos decks, Junt decks, also I could imagine in Grixis style decks. Yeah, um, all in all, I would rate this card a 9 out of 10. So this is really a card I'm really, um, yeah, uh, hyped about. So I would personally spend, uh, I guess, three car uh, wild cards on it. I guess three is okay because, yeah, um, Four banners, um, yeah, pretty uh, hard, not hard, but uh, pretty much. So yeah, maybe three or four if you're really into it. So definitely a super a good card. Um, yeah. Okay. Now we have the devouring sugar more <laughs> sugar more. Okay. So it the creature in itself is um, horror a six six body for. For mana, pretty good. It has menace and trample. So this is really um, a force to be reckoned with. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you may sacrifice an artifact, enchantment, or a token. If you don't, tap the Warring uh, Sugar more. And has an in, uh, adventure, an instant adventure to have for dinner. And create a 1-1 one, one, uh, human creature token and a food token. So this is pretty good. So you get... For two mana, um, a creature token and a food token. So this is kind of nice. So this card, um, yeah, is pretty cool. So you can inflict, um, uh, yeah, a lot of damage if you are willing to sacrifice, um, yeah, an enchantment, a token or an artifact every turn. Um, if you cast the instant adventure 
on uh, before you cast a creature you can definitely uh, sacrifice t um, yeah two times um, for the devouring sugar moss so this creature is pretty good also is yeah kind of good for example in a anvil deck so the anvil deck you always will sacrifice um you uh, or you could sacrifice it your upkeep and create another artifact token with the anvil and yeah have a uh, fodder for the devouring sugar more so this card definitely is interesting so and it has a really good body with the menace trample for four mana so yeah definitely an interesting card we will probably uh, <laughs> see a little bit of play uh, the artwork is a bit <laughs> strange uh, are these cherries yeah maybe so yeah i would rate this a 6 or 6.5 not sure and if you love um yeah some sacrifice or the roll token model deck then yeah you can go for it would probably spend two or three on these kind of like this card okay now we have the elusive otter uh, so, um, the creature is a prowess creature mm, for one mana in blue color. You get a 1-1 one, one body, has prowess. So whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gets plus 1, plus 1 until the end of turn. And creatures with power less than elusive otter's power can't block it. So yeah, kind of nice little creature. Then we have the adventure sorcery, uh, Groove's Bounty. Distribute X plus one plus one counters uh, among any number of creature uh, target creatures you control. So um, this card, uh, I guess, um, will maybe seen in some Simic decks. Um, get a pretty good value for one mana. Um, so this is really beneficial from it. Uh, also kind of nice that it is unblockable if it has a really high power. So to benefit, um, yeah, more from it, you have to buff um, the elusive otter's power either with plus one plus one counters or with the prowess trigger. So yeah, this is kind of interesting card. Um, it is a bit situational and you have to protect it uh, if you want to build a deck around it. Um, I could see this in a deck uh, combined with Ivy would, yeah, would be kind of nice. So maybe there is definitely a, a build around this card. So if you're into, uh, yeah, prowl stuff, um, yeah, can definitely dispense some wild cards on it. Um, I'm not, um, super much hyped about Simic decks. So, uh, I personally wouldn't spend too much wild cards on it, but if you like um, Simic, um, yeah, what it is bad, or maybe um, uh, what's the other color combination? Um, Sultai, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're in uh, uh, Sultai decks uh, and want to include this in, uh, yeah, I guess Prowess Seed Style deck, yeah. I guess you could go for it, but personally, I would just rate it as 6 out of 10. Okay, next card is the Elvish uh, Archivist. So it is a elf artificer for 2 mana. Uh, it's just a 0-1 creature. Um, it has a lot of text in it. So whenever one or more artifacts enter the battlefield under your control, put, a pl uh, put 2 plus 1 plus 1 characters on Elvish uh, Archivist, uh, this ability triggers only once each turn. So the first ability, yeah, is kind of nice. So if you can create a lot of artifacts, this will grow, um, yeah, pretty fast. So this will become a huge threat. Downside is um, at the beginning, it is very uh, vulnerable. And let's talk about the second ability. And whenever one or more enchantments enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card this ability triggers uh, only once each uh, turn so pretty interesting uh, either benefits artifacts or enchantment enters the battlefield so in an enchantment deck this gives you uh, a card draw engine so pretty good in an artifact style deck this gives you um yeah um, 
uh, growing thread, so kind of nice. Um, I'm not sure if you really uh, can combine um, artifact and enchantments. Not sure about this, but um, I think this card is pretty good. So I would personally rate this uh, 7 out of 10 because of its versatility and you could definitely spend 2 or 3 wild cards on that. Okay, the next card we want to discuss is the Expel the Interlopers. So it is a sorcery for 5 mana and is a board wipe. So choose a number between um, 0 and 10. Destroy all creatures with power greater than or equal to the chosen number. So you can choose to, yeah, choose uh, zero, then it will board wipe all creatures. But the cool thing about this board wipe is you can target whatever you want. So if you, for example, play soldiers uh, and all your creatures uh, have uh, power toughness two or three and you're facing uh, playing against mono green, mono green has all the big creatures and then you can just choose uh, for example, a four and it will destroy all the creatures, uh, basically all the creatures one green player has, uh, except, uh, yeah, low power, uh, creatures. So this board wipe is pretty good. So I would personally rate it eight or 8.5 out of 10. So this is pretty versatile. You have it in your hands, which, uh, creatures to destroy. So I really like it. Um, not sure if it is better than Sunfall. It, yeah, is, yeah, uh, good in another way, but, um, also kind of nice. So you could definitely spend, uh, two or three wild cards on it if you wanna have this super cool new board wipe. So the next card we wanna discuss is the Extraordinary Journey. So, um, for, Two mana in blue color and a X cost, uh, a double X cost. It is an enchantment. And when extraordinary, extraordinary journey enters the battlefield, except up to X creature cards. For each of these creature, uh, of these, those cards, its owner may play it for as long as it remains exiled. And whenever one or more uh, non tongue creatures uh, enter the battlefield, if one or more of them entered uh, from exile or was cast from exile, you draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. So this makes, yeah, this is a kind of interesting card. So let me read the second part again. Whenever one or more non-token creatures enter the battlefield, if one or more of them enters from exile or was cast from exile, you draw a card. So um you can uh, exile um creatures for example opposing creatures and if opponent plays them you will draw a card but only once a turn but you can only uh, also do it on your own cards if you want to get the etb effect um yeah once more so it is a kind of nice card um yeah, bit hard to apply, not gonna lie. Um, also, you can pair this up with uh, cards like uh, all Excise stuff, for example, Rent's Resolve, Rocco, the Feral Encounter, or the other Exile effects, and then you will draw out of it. So, but the downside is it is kind of expensive. So to just exile one creature, you uh, have to spend four mana on it. Yeah, not that easy. Um, it is kind of slow, but powerful. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really into that. So I would just rate it a four out of 10. And do you want to uh, spend wild cards on it? If you want to build a blinking deck, so maybe then you could spend one or two wild cards on it. Next card we want to discuss is the fairy slumber party. So for six mana, you get a sorcery. Um, for um, double blue colors and return all creatures to their owner's hands. For each opponent who controls a creature returned this way, you create two 1-1 one, one blue fairy creature tokens with flying and this creature can block only creatures with flying. So, 
Uh, I have to say, in standard, I really don't like this card. Uh, it really don't gives you that much value for six mana. Um, in commander, this card, yeah, can be pretty good uh, in later turns, but for standard, um, I really don't say that this card will, uh, uh, will probably ever uh, be played. Uh, so I don't, yeah, I don't think you will see this card very often. Uh, will definitely not be coming part of the meta. So I would personally only rate this a three out of ten for standard. Um, you know, also historic or alchemy. I um, really don't think this card makes, um, yeah, a huge impact for its cost. So I'm really not into it. Um, in commander, yeah. It maybe it has um, or definitely has some play, but I wouldn't spend any wild card on it. So yeah, definitely mm, nothing that, uh, not to recommend here. So the next card uh, is the Far Side Ritual. So for for mana you get an instant. It has the bargain effect. So you may sacrifice an artifact, enchantment, or token as you can cast the spell. And look at the top four cards of your library. If the spell was bargained, look at the top eight card of your library instead. Put two of them into your hand and the rest of them of your library in any random order. So for, for mana, you can dig uh, four or eight cards deep into your library and choose two cards uh, out of it. So pretty nice, yeah. Mm. Card value um, spare. Uh, really reminds me of the memory deluge. So is it better than memory deluge? Um, I'm not 100% sure. In the memory deluge, uh, you don't uh, can bargain. Uh, you don't have to sack anything and you uh, are able to play it um, with the flashback ability. On the other hand, um, if you bargain the far side ritual, you can uh, look eight card deeps in your uh, library. Uh, oftentimes, this if is enough to get one or two things you really need. So it is kind of nice. Um, not sure if it is better than memory deluge. I would, yeah, rate it rather the same. So, um, my opinion, this is a 6.5 out of 10. Um, if you like control decks, you can definitely spend uh, without a regret two copies of the Farset Ritual. Okay, next card is the Fawn's Bane Thrower. So, uh, for mana and Golgari colors, you get a Thrower for for body. When it enters the battlefield, create a monster roll token attached to it. Um, this roll token gives um, the Fawn's Bane Thrower plus one plus one and trample. Uh, so this alone makes this card, I would guess, pretty good or solid. So for four mana, you get a 5-5 five, five Trampler. This alone is pretty good. And then you can, um, the Fawn's Troll has the ability to sacrifice an aura attached to Fawn's Troll. Uh, Fawn's Troll fights target creature you don't control. If that creature would die this turn, exile it instead. Um, but you can uh, activate this only as a sorcery. But this card is really kind of interesting, so definitely um, you will yeah see this in uh, Aura decks. Um, maybe there is uh, an absent version with um, yeah, maybe an Audacity uh, also attached to it. Um, can sack it, uh, will draw a card from the Audacity, and then you will uh, fight. So yeah, I guess there are I guess many ways um to really benefit from this card so this is definitely a good one so personally would rate it um a seven out of ten and how many wild cards would i spend on it so yeah i guess if you like the aura enchantment decks you definitely uh yeah could spend uh, two or three wild cards on this one so this is a pretty good card so the next card is the feral encounter so uh, it has a double green symbol in it, so mm, in most cases you just will play this in mono green. But maybe it has some play in maybe Gruel. 
Golgari or yeah other style decks so and it is a sorcery it is a rare and look at the top five cards of your library you may excite a creature card from among them put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order you may cast a exile card this turn and at the beginning of the next uh, combat phase target creature you control deals damage equal to its power up to one target creature you don't control Okay, let's split this card. So, um, the first part. You may cast the Exile card this turn. So, in the early turns, you can't really play this card because you don't get any value out of it. Um, just if you really can, um, yeah, uh, have a low uh, mana cost creature card uh, in your first uh, top five cards. So um, this card makes more sense in later turns. Um, and for the second ability, um, target creature you control this damage equal to its power to, uh, to one target creature you don't control. It is kind of nice, but it requires you to have a creature on the battlefield. And also um, it should be a creature with a uh, high power. Otherwise you really don't... Um, deal that much damage um, so this card is kind of okay uh, it is not cool that you have to uh, cast the excite card uh, this turn would be cooler if um, it would remain excite and you could cast it um, whenever you want but um, it's just this turn so um, it makes it a little bit awkward not gonna lie so I personally would just rate it a 5 out of 10. Uh, maybe in some mono green decks it has some play, but um, I don't know if I would spend any wild card on this. If you're really into mono green, then maybe you can spend one or two of these, but uh, if you don't spend any wild card on these, I don't think you really will miss. Uh, Okay, next card is the Food Fight. It is an enchantment for two mana, um, two mana and red colors. And artifacts you control have uh, for two. Uh, sacrifice this artifact. It deals damage to any target equal to one plus the number of permanents named Food Fight you control. Yeah, so uh, in order to make, uh, to make this card work, you have to include, uh, yeah, um some copies of the food fight in it um uh, so for example you have three food fights out you have some uh, let's say food tokens or treasure tokens so with three food fights out um you can sack of food and shoot any target for for damage it is okay but it was really hard to apply uh, apply you have to yeah to make it really worse uh, at least have two or three uh, of the food fights out to really make an impact uh, and then it is kind of slow so um, for for example for three food fights you would have to spend six mana and then spend two mana to even sacrifice uh, the artifact and then deal the damage so maybe uh, you can um, make a deck out of it but uh, I really am not sure about this card um, personally uh, my rating for this is just a 1 out of 10 so I don't think you can really apply uh, this in uh, an easy or an easy way. Um, so I personally wouldn't spend any wild card on it. Um, okay, the next card we want to discard is Godric, Cloak Revealer. So for three ma uh, red mana, you get a 3-3 three, three with haste. So this alone is kind of okay. Has the celebration effect on it. So celebration is as long as two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn. Godric, Cloak Revealer, is a dragon with base power and toughness 4-4 four, four flying and has the ability to buff uh, dragons you control, get plus 1 plus 0 until the end of turn. So, 
Hmm. Interesting card for sure. But um, can you really um, apply the celebration effect very often? So, um, obviously, this can fit in a dragon themed uh, style deck. Um, the celebration is a nice addition. Not sure if you really can trigger this that often. Um, maybe um, the roll tokens are a way um, to make this um, a little bit easier, but in my opinion, it is not really easy to, uh, yeah make uh, use of the celebration uh, a couple of turns so i personally mm, would this just give a five out of ten don't get me wrong it is a nice card but um, to really uh, have a bit impact you have to focus off uh, on the celebration and the celebration isn't that easy to get in my opinion Maybe I'm wrong, then um, then I would rate this higher, but at the moment I would just give this a uh, 5 out of 10. And wild cards to spend, if you like, um, if you want to build around a celebration themed deck, then yeah, maybe uh, spend 2, maybe 3 wild cards on it. But I personally wouldn't spend any wild card on it. Okay, so here are the Gruff Triplets. It is a Satyr Warrior for 6 mana, has triple force symbol in it. It is a 3-3 tr trample creature and when it enters the battlefield, it, it, if it isn't a token, create two tokens that are copies of it. So let's split it, um, this card. So a first ability. If it enters the battlefield, you can create two tokens that are copies of it. So for six mana, uh, you get three, uh, um, three, three creatures with trample. So this already makes this creature really kind of good, but it has more. So when a, a graph triplets dies, put, um, a number of plus one plus one counters equal to its power on each creature you control named graph triplets. So if one graph triplets dies, it buffs, um, each other graph triplets. Um, so if one dies, um, the other ones become uh, six sixes. Um, so uh, even um, and just uh, if this creature isn't buffed, is this uh, if the creature is buffed, you yeah, this will become a pretty pretty huge threat. It is already a huge threat, so I really kind of like this card. So if you uh, combine uh, or buff um, this uh, power of this creature, so it really becomes a huge threat. So I really like this card. So I personally would rate it a 9 out of 10. Um, it is really a good card for mono green. So how many white cards do I would spend on this? So because uh, 6 mana cost, it's, it is pretty high, not gonna lie. So. Personally, would we'll just spend two wild cards on it, but um, you won't regret spending two wild cards on it. So definitely a really good card, kind of like it. So next creature is the Gumdrop Poisoner. It is an adventure card. So it is for three mana. You get a human warlock with lifelink. And when the Gumdrop Poisoner enters the battlefield, up to one target creature gets Minus X, minus X until the end of turn, where X is the amount of life you gained this turn. So pretty cool. You get a 3-2 body with lifelink and you can, yeah, destroy a creature uh, equal to the number of life you gained uh, this turn. So if you have a lifelink on board or ge uh, get a life in any other way, you can uh, destroy a creature. So pretty good value out of it and then it has an instant adventure 10 with tears so for one black mana create a food token so uh, if uh, you don't have any lifelink uh, lifelink on the board or don't have any other lifelink stuff uh, you can definitely create a food token and at least uh, on turn 5 you can sack the food token gains 3 life 
um, play the gumdrop poison and then destroy a creature with um, toughness three or less so pretty good value so yeah kind of like it so i definitely think this is a, a six or seven um out of ten um we we'll definitely say uh see some play and some life they get uh lifelink decks um so really like this card so um if you like lifelink um you can definitely include it and yeah nothing wrong to spend for um to uh, for, uh, for wild cards on it so definitely a good card so next card is the hard flame duelist so it is a also adventure card um it is a creature for two mana in white color it is a human uh, knight three one body and instant and saucy spells you control have lifelink okay so it's kind of good in um yeah um direct damage um uh, spell seam deck and it has the instant adventure the hard flame slash hard flame slash deals three damage to any target so it is kind of uh, sad that to get the full value out of it you have to cast the adventure uh, instant first and uh, on the later turns play uh, the hard flame duelist uh, out as a creature so will this uh, see a lot of play um maybe you can really uh, try to uh, make um yeah an instant sorcery deck or uh, all about uh, the hard flame duelist um the lifelink ability is kind of nice so could definitely see some um yeah boros madu or jaska decks um focused around this card so it is kind of nice so i would rate this personally a 7 out of 10 kind of cool uh, you have to like these kind of decks so if you like these kind of decks so definitely you can spend two or three um wild cards on this one okay the next is the horned lock whale so um, the horned lock whale is a flash creature with what two um but it enters the battlefield tapped uh, unless it's your turn so this creature uh, isn't able to ambush the opponent kind of sad so this alone is not super exciting um the flash in war 2 is kind of nice but uh, the tapped uh, kind of sucks so for six mana a six hit flash and ward is okay but also not something super special but we have also uh, the instant adventure lagoon breach for two mana and the owner of target attacking creature you don't control puts it on top of your bottom or library so this is really kind of cool because uh not uh you uh, you only can bounce the uh, opponent's creature but also um the opponent has to draw uh, into it so this is really kind of cool instant i like it so combined together um the instant is kind of valuable not gonna lie um not uh, super excited about the creature but if you can get uh, uh play the creature um, in the later turns if you don't have uh any stuff going on i guess it's a kind of nice addition so all in all a solid card i would personally rate it a six out of ten is a good filler card if you want to play it in a control style deck so yeah i guess six out of ten is fine and how many wild cards would i spend on this mm, yeah um if you want to build a control style deck and this really fits then i guess uh yeah can probably spend one maybe two uh, on these bad boys so yeah i guess one or two is kind of fine so the next card is hilda of the icy crown uh, for four mana in uh, zorius colors you get a human warlock legendary three for body and whenever you tap an untapped creature and an opponent controls you may pay one if you pay it 
You can choose between create a 4 4 white and blue elemental creature token, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature you control, or scry 2 and then draw a card. So, kinda like this card, so it is super versatile. So, you uh, if you wanna really make use of Hilda uh, of the Icy Ground, you, yeah, you may wanna, I guess, build your deck around it and create many um, uh, ways to tap opponent's creatures, maybe put some stun, uh, stun counters on it. So, yeah, if you uh, can enable it uh, with other creatures or artifacts, for example, that can tap uh, opposing creatures, this is really, really cool if it stays on the battlefield. So to create some 4 for white tokens is pretty good. To buff all your creatures is pretty insane. And yeah, the card draw is also kind of nice. So a really nice card. Um, so what would be, uh, what would be cards to combine it with? Maybe, um, Hilda's crown, um, we will discuss later is a bit, uh, good addition. Then we have the dream shackle ghost. Um, so if you want to just reading my notes, so because, uh, yeah, it is really hard to remember, uh, all the cards which, uh, benefit from other, um, in this deck. So the dream shackle guys, uh, would be pretty nice. Also, uh, there's the ice rod sentry, another, um, I guess common or uncommon in the set, uh, that can tap. We have Tamio's immobilizer. We have Tamio. If you want to build a band deck, so with Tamiyo on the board, you can every turn tap uh, an opponent's creature, which doesn't untap. You can pay the one and yeah, create uh, a lot of elementals, buff your creatures or draw cards. So yeah, this is a pretty versatile card. So I really kind of like it. So I would give this hmm a 7.5 or 8 out of 10. So pretty cool card. It is a mystic, but it is pretty, yeah, it has a pretty cool ability. Um, how many wild cards would I spend on it? Mm, yeah, I will definitely try to build a deck around it. So I will definitely spend two or three wild cards on it. Um, if you don't, uh, like these control type decks, then, um, skip this card. But if you like control uh, type decks, then yeah, definitely nothing wrong to spend two or three wild cards on this one okay the next card is the hilda's crown of winter so we discussed the creature now it is her crown a legendary artifact and for three mana it is a uh, rare and for one and to tap the artifact a uh, tap target creature this ability costs one less to activate uh, if it's during your turn so combined with hilda you can tap this artifact um, and can pay one from Hilda and create, yeah, the 4 for token, buff your creatures or draw a card. So kind of, yeah, uh, kind of good in um, a Hilda deck. So nothing wrong about that and has a second ability. So for three mana, you can sack uh, Hilda's crown of the winter, draw a card for each tap creature your opponent's control. So you can do, do this in opponent's uh, turn and dra uh, then draw a huge amount of cards. So if you're facing, for example, soldiers and uh, soldiers uh, for soldiers attack you, then you can um, sack the Hilda's crown uh, for three and then redraw three cards. So this is a pretty good value. So all in all solid, but not too impressive. So I personally would rate this maybe a 4 or 4.5. Not super huge. Um, I guess there are a lot of way to tap creatures. The second ability is kind of nice, but also just in certain situations. So if you're facing uh, other control decks, um, the second ability doesn't do anything for, uh, for you. Um, and also the first ability really don't uh, do anything for you. So yeah, I'm not sure. So I personally, I would rate it for 4.5. Um, did, will I spend any wild on it? Um, not sure about it. I guess there are other ways to tap creatures. So, um, 
if you're really hyped about the Hilda deck, then maybe you can spend uh, one, uh, maximum two uh, out of this. But I personally, I guess I wouldn't spend any wild card on it. So the next card we want to discuss is Imundane, the Pyro Hammer. So for four mana in double red colors, you get a legendary human knight for four. And whenever an instant or sorcery spell you control that targets only a single uh, creature deals damage to a creature, uh, Imodian deals that much damage to each opponent. So this card definitely makes more sense in commander format than in standard. So in standard, you will only, um, yeah, your instant and sorceries that deal damage to a single creature will, all, uh, will also deal dam that much damage to the opponent. So, yeah, maybe there is a, a build uh, focused about instant and sorceries uh, where this kind of works. Um, what would be some cards uh, benefiting from uh, them? Um, the Heart Flame Duelist we discussed earlier uh, would be nice. Um, so all your instant sorceries have lifelink. So you will, you could uh, survive uh, longer. Would be a good addition. Solfin is kind of good. Would the, uh, double the amount of damage. But there's also um, an enchantment. I guess it's one of the virtue cards we'll discuss later that also can double the damage from, um, yeah, instant and sorcery. So, yeah. Um, I'm not super hyped about it. Um, I would rate it a 5 out of 10. So in certain uh, decks, this is really a cool card, but in most cases, you won't see this uh, uh, this card and definitely not really becoming part of the meta. So just a 5 out of 10. It is kind of nice, but if you want to build, um, yeah, an uh, instant and sorcery um, themed deck uh, that deals damage to creatures, yeah, yeah, you can go for it. Then I would spend one or two wild cards on it. But personally, I guess I won't spend any wild cards on it. Okay, the next card is the Ingenious Prodigy, a human wizard. Um, a O2 body. Um, the mana cost is one blue and X. And the creature has Skulk. This creature can't be blocked by creature with greater power. And the Prodigy enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. So you determine the strength of this creature. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if in Ingenious Prodigy has one or more plus one plus one counters on it, you may remove a plus one plus one from, from it. If you do, draw a card. Okay. So the second ability uh, or the last ability is pretty good. So you can constantly remove a counter from the Ingenious Prodigy and draw a card. So if the opponent doesn't remove the creature, uh, you will, yeah, draw as long as it has a plus one plus one card on it. So I guess the best attempt uh, to include this card is in a plus one plus one counters deck. So you could combine this maybe with a Roaring Earth. The Roaring Earth uh, is enchantment. And whenever uh, a land enters the battlefield, uh, you can put a plus one plus one counter. Um, on target creature you control. So if you can manage to, yeah, um, put plus one plus one counters on it, uh, you, yeah, you can basically uh, draw two cards uh, each turn if you have one prodigy out. So yeah, kind of cool card. Um, it is vulnerable to removal. So personally, I would rate it as a six out of 10. And how many wild cards would I spend on it? If you think you can uh, make a good deck out of it with plus one plus one counters, um, yeah, you can definitely spend two or three wild cards on it. Um, it definitely will have some play. So yeah, a good card, pretty solid. So the next card is Kellen, the Fae Blooded. So for three mana, you get a human fairy, uh, a legendary human fairy. Um, it also has adventure on it. So the creature is a 2-2 with double strike. 
Other creatures you control get plus one plus O oh for each aura and equipment attached to Kellen, the Fey Blooded. So this alone is pretty good. Double Strike is kind of nice. Uh, you also buff all other creatures for each aura and equipment attached to Kellen. So I am personally, I'm not a huge fan of equipments because uh, in my opinion, equipments never work. They are way too slow. Um, and against uh, removal heavy decks, this is really, um, <laughs> uh, you don't have any chance. So uh, I'm not a huge fan of equipments, but on the other hand, uh, auras um, is kind of interesting because um, in this set, there are many ways to create the roll tokens. So this is an easy way um, to enchant the Kellen. So it is a kind of nice card. Um, it also has the sorcery adventure, uh, the birthright boon for two mana in white color. And gives you a tutor effect. Search your library for an aura or equipment card, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle. So this is kind of nice. Um, yeah, you really get uh, some good benefit from this card, from uh, the tutor effect, and you have a tutu double striker on a board. It's pretty solid. Um, definitely has some play in um, aura decks. Not sure about equipment decks. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm not convinced about uh, that uh, equipment decks are any good, but maybe I'm wrong, not sure. Um, so I would give this uh, a 6 out of 10. It is very situational, um, only built for aura or equipment decks. So if you're into aura and equipment decks, definitely can um, spend three wild cards, uh, two or three wild cards on this one. So I personally am not sure if, so I'm not uh, into equipments, like I said. Not sure if I really can go uh, build the aura deck around it. So, um, personally, uh, I'm not sure how many white cards I would spend, uh, uh, to be honest. <clears throat> so, the next card is the Lady of Laughter. Uh, it is a fairy noble, um, mono white, uh, for five mana. You get a four five flying creature. So, that alone is. Okay, not impressive, but it also has the celebration. So celebration at the beginning of your end step, if two or more non land permanents enter the battlefield under your control, this turn draw a card. Um, yeah. Mm. So let me think about it. So on turn five, you play it, you definitely will not get the celebration uh, bonus. So, uh, in the worst cases, the opponent just will remove it and you don't get any value out of it. But if the opponent is out of removal and this one can maybe stay for one or two, uh, turns on the battlefield and you are in some way able to get the celebration trigger, you will draw the card, so this is kind of nice. So personally, um, I don't think it is super good. Uh, it is okay, but I guess not meta defined. So my personal rating would be a six out of 10. Um, it has some potential. Um, maybe if you want to build a deck about celebration, you can include it. Then I would spend probably yeah, I guess one or two wild cards um, on it, but if you don't want to play a celebration deck, um, just skip it. So the next card is the is the Lich Knight's Conquest. So it is a sorcery for five mana, and you sacrifice any number of artifacts, enchantments, or tokens. Return that many creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. So. This is predestinated for a reanimator uh, themed deck. Um, so, for example, um, you can include this in a roll token deck or a red tribal deck. No, red tribal, maybe not. Maybe, um, yeah, food token uh, or token, a uh, roll token deck. Then 
you include some bigger threats like a truck side tali you manage to mill these in your graveyard or have some draw and discard effects you also manage to create some treasure food or row tokens uh, so i guess this isn't that hard um, so uh, in i guess most cases you can at least sacrifice some um yeah smaller stuff and get some uh, creatures out so if you don't fa uh, facing a counter magic user um or the opponent has a, a graveyard hate uh so um yeah this is a pretty cool card i really liked it um but i also like reanimated decks so i think this is a pre uh, pretty cool card um I don't think it is that hard to create some yeah, roll tokens, red tokens, whatever, some food or uh, treasure tokens. So um, I think you can sack some stuff to um, this one and bring some pretty cool ca uh, cards out of the graveyard. So if you imagine to just sack, uh, for example, one treasure and two photo, uh, food tokens, two full food tokens and then bring back uh, a tali a truxa and other stuff from the graveyard um this can end um games pretty quick so really a uh, pretty cool card it also um, kind of good in combination with the uh, likeness looter uh, another cool card we will discuss later it is a looting card uh uh, so you can draw on this card, uh, fill your graveyard. Um, yeah, but we will discard this, uh, card later. So I will definitely rate the Lich Knight's Conquest a 7 out of 10. So I like reanimation, uh, decks. So I definitely would include, um, yeah, maybe, yeah, three or four copies of it. If you wanna build, um, reanimator themed deck. This is really a pretty good card for it. Okay, next card is the Likeness Looter. So this was the card I mentioned um, in the previous card, the uh, Lich uh, King's Conquest. So this is a nice addition to it. So if you want to build a reanimator deck, this is a pretty good card. So let me explain it. It is for two colors, uh, uh, for two mana and uh, demon colors, you get a fairy shapeshifter, a one one body with flying. So one one body always kind of fragile, so um, easy to shoot, but it has the ability to draw and discard a card. So you, um, in best cases, you draw a card, then discard one of your big creatures like Itali, uh, Titan of Industry, a Truxa, or other big stuff you want to reanimate. Also has the cool ability um, that like. Um, um, the second ability, um, X mana cost and the likeness looter becomes a copy of target creature card in your graver with mana value X, except it has flying and disability. So pretty cool. So you can basically transform this into one of your creatures in your graveyard. So pretty cool. So the downside is it's just a one one. So like I said, pretty fragile, but, um, yeah. Um, it has some cool abilities, so personally, I would, would rate this card a 7 out of 10. So definitely a good card if you want to build it around, uh, yeah, reanimator, I guess is the most, uh, the, I guess the most, uh, the best way for this card, but also could see it in a fairy seam deck, maybe. So yeah, 7 out of 10. And personally, um, you, I guess, can spend two to four wild cards on it because it's uh, non-legendary. It, yeah, uh, it is, yeah, uh, with two mana, um, good to have in the early curve. So, yeah, kind of like it. So, yeah, definitely can two, uh, spend two or four wild cards without a doubt. So, next card is Lord Skitter's Blessing. It is an enchantment. It is a rare. Has two, uh, yeah. Abilities, I would say, and when enters the battlefield, create a wicked roll token attached to target creature you control. The attached creature gets plus one plus one, 
And when the aura is put into graveyard, each opponent loses one life. So pretty good. But the second ability is what really matters. And at the beginning of your draw step, if you control an enchanted creature, you lose one life and you draw an additional card. So this turns this card basically into a smaller version of the Phyrexian Arena. If you have an enchanted creature on the battlefield. So if you um, include this card into a roll token um, themed deck or an aura deck, uh, it shouldn't hard to have an enchanted creature on the battlefield. So we'll, you will constantly draw uh, an additional card. So this is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, in some way you have to mitigate the loss of life, but I guess you can pair this also up with a bargain card. And <clears throat> if you don't want to lose <coughs> any more life, you can bargain this card. So yeah, pretty versatile. So I kind of like this card. So this has, yeah, definitely some potential for some kind of decks. So I guess you can buy, combine this with, um, yeah, the roll tokens. Then uh, tokens would also kind of benefit from it. Aura decks and yeah, this is kind of nice. Uh, not gonna lie. So I would rate this uh, yeah 7.5 or 8 um, because the constant uh, card draw is pretty insane. Uh, if you yeah apply it on turn two, so yeah. I really like this card. Um, personally, uh, if you wanna. Yeah, play a roll token deck or a aura deck. You definitely should include this and yeah, can definitely spend two or three wild cards on it. Okay, next card is Lord Skidder, the Sewer King. So for three mana, you get a 3-3 legendary red noble and has two abilities. Whenever another red enters the battlefield under your control, Exile up to one target card from an opponent's graveyard. So has the gra uh, graveyard hate ability. So this is pretty nice. Graveyard hate can shut down, um, yeah, uh, some uh, deck types. For example, um, a reanimator deck, um, yeah, has some problems against Lord Skidder if they can't deal with it. Uh, you can exile all the reanimation targets. So. Graveyard hate in some matchup is really important. So yeah, pretty good ability. But the skitter has more. So at the beginning of combat of your turn, create a one-one black red um, creature token, but this creature can't block. So the skitter makes every turn a red token. Pretty cool. And the red token, uh, red tokens trigger uh, Lord Skitter himself, so that he can exile one of opponent's uh, card in graveyard so a pretty cool card um not even in a red tribal deck um this card yeah is good in red tribal i guess in token decks because it makes const uh, constant tokens um yeah and definitely uh has a lot of potential so i really like this card um um, what other cards you could combine it? Um, there's another card called the Old Argre uh, Skitter Lord. Uh, let me look for it. Then I will explain why it is a good addition to it. So the Old Argre uh, uh, Skitter Lord um, also uh, makes red tokens. And um, if you then have more reds, uh, five or more reds, each red you control gets plus. 2 plus also pretty good in addition to that. So you could build a Rector's Red Trouble deck, include Lord Skidder and the, this Ogre card. And yeah, would be pretty nice. Could buff all the creatures, uh, create constant threats uh, with the red tokens. Can also combine it, for example, in the Orzhov deck. Uh, played with Rites of Oblivion, uh, can exile stuff from the opponent. So yeah, plenty of ways to include this card. So yeah, I would say this is definitely a 7 or 7.5. Kind of like this card. Um, and really has um, 
is pretty versatile, so probably would spend yeah two or three wild cards on it. Okay, next card is the Maid of Orland uh, Witch Kite. It is a Dragon Warlock for six mana. You get a five for Dragon. And when it enters the battlefield, sacrifice any number of artifacts, enchantments, or tokens. Then draw that many cards. So you can combine this with a lot of cards. For example, uh, Lord Skidder is a kind of nice way to create some red tokens. And when this enters the battlefield, um, so the Lord Skidder was maybe turn three uh, until turn six. You would create um, three red tokens, I guess. Uh, you can sack all these red tokens and draw. Yeah, pretty uh, nice amount of cards. So this card is pretty versatile and pretty good to draw a lot of cards. It's also kind of good in, yeah. If you combine this with a yeah food treasure token deck, also in uh, aura, and I guess in a Ors of Orza deck, uh, Ors of aura deck, it would be kind of nice addition, and then in a token deck. So it is pretty versatile. Downside is yeah, it has six mana. It is really expensive, but it has a pretty cool effect. So uh, in best cases, you will draw um, yeah. I guess some cards out of it. So this is a pretty good value. So personally, I would rate this a seven out of 10. I like this card. The art style also is kind of cool. Um, but because it's so expensive, um, I would just spend one or two wild card on this. Even so, I like it. Okay. Next card is the Moonshaker Cavalry. So for a huge amount, eight mana. Uh, triple uh, white, you get a spirit knight, 6-6 six, six body and flying. So 8 mana is pretty intensive for mono white. Um, and triple white means basically just mono white can cast the spell. So, and has the ability that when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain flying and get plus X plus X until the end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. So the best way to make use of this card is to include it in, I guess, a token deck or an aggressive mono white style deck. Um, yeah, cards you really combine this with would be, I guess, the resolute reinforcements, um, maybe Adeline, a Mondrak, uh, for example. But there are also some newer cards like, um, what is it? Uh, the pollen shield hair, the regal bunny corn. Uh, I will explain them later. So this is basically a crater hoof behemoth. So crater hoof behemoth was, um, uh, what was it? A beast, a seven, seven. Um, and when it entered the battlefield, it buffs all other creatures, um, equal to the number of creatures you control and gives them trample. This one gives, uh, flying. It's also kind of nice. Only downside for this card is that uh, it target its uh, yeah itself, but it because it doesn't have haste, it can't attack the turn it comes in. So, but uh, if you have some creatures on the board, for example, you have four or five creatures on the board, you drop this. Uh, in most games, you will end it uh, on the spot. So. Yeah, this is a pretty huge uh, effect. So, yeah, this can win you the game outright. So, definitely a cool card. The downside, like I said, is the huge mana cost of 8. So, it is hard, uh, yeah, to ever get to 8 mana. But it really has a huge impact. So, I would rate this a 9 out of 10 because... The ability to end games uh, on the spot is pretty huge. So pretty impactful. Um, how many wild cards do you want to spend on this? If you are, if you are into mono white or a token decks, you can definitely, yeah, spend two wild cards on it. Uh, definitely not, uh, yeah, failure, but, um, yeah, eight mana is expensive. So. Don't expect it to play it too often. 
So the next card is the Moss Wooded Dread Knight. It is a human knight for two mana and green colors. And for two mana you get a trample 3-2 creature. This alone is pretty huge. But when the Mosswood Red Knight dies, you may cast it from your graveyard as an adventure until the end of your next turn. And the adventure is the Dread Whispers. So for two mana in mono black colors, um, you draw a card and you lose a life. This is pretty cool. So you basically play the adventure, lose a life, draw a card, then you play the Mosswood Dread Knight. Mm, then eventually the, the Mosso Dread Knight will go down. Then you will, can recast, uh, the adventure from the graveyard. And then I'm not sure if you recast it from the graveyard, then, um, uh, I think you can replay, uh, the creature side. So the Mosso Dread Knight. So yeah, if I think, uh, it, yeah, it can be played this way. Uh, you can constantly cut uh, either of these sides if you can manage to um, play it from the graveyard until to your next turn. So, not sure if it really works like uh, I mentioned. If it works in that way, then this card is super huge. Uh, so, if it is like I described, then I would rate it a 10 out of 10 because you will constantly can recast it again, uh, again. So you have super much value out of it. Uh, if you can't cast the Mosswood uh, Dread Knight after you uh, cast the Dread Whispers from the graveyard, then it is still kind of good. Then I would just rate it a seven out of 10. So yeah. All in all, a pretty good card, so you can definitely spend some wild cards on this. Um, I personally would, yeah, at least spend three wild cards on it if you're into an adventure. But yeah, I would definitely spend three for this one. So the next card um, is the Ogre Sitter Lord. Um, six mana for a mana's Ogre Warrior. 6-5 six, five, six, five body, so I'm pretty okay. But when it enters the battlefield, all attacks create two 1-1 one, one black red creature tokens, um, and these uh, red tokens can't block. And then if you control five or more reds, each red you control gets plus O plus, uh, plus two plus O until the end of turn. So in a red tribal deck, um, you definitely will create some red tokens until you play the Ogre Sitter Lord. Um, and the Sitter Lord itself makes two tokens when it enters the battlefield. And then when, uh, when it attacks, you, uh, you most definitely have at least five uh, red tokens, um, in, uh, on the battlefield and they get plus, um, uh, two plus also a Pretty cool force to uh, reckon with. So this is a pretty cool card. Not gonna lie. Can include this in a red trouble or a token deck. So really like this card. Um, also kind of good uh, combined with the male wanted witch, uh, witch kite, the dragon that, um, yeah, when it enters the battlefield, uh, you draw cards. So for example, if you play this on turn six, um, and then play on turn seven, the male volant, uh, witch kite. You can basically, um, sacrifice four, re uh, at least four red tokens to the witch kite and then draw four cards. So this card has plenty of way, uh, um, a ton of play, uh, in, I guess, mon red, rectors, colors, uh, or other stuff. So this is a pretty cool card. Only downside is the huge cost of six mana. So, but I would still rate this uh, 8 out of 10. Reminds me of the Grave Titan, a little bit worse, but also kind of buffs your creatures. So another way kind of good. So yeah, definitely will spend, um, I guess, two wild cards on this bad boy. Okay, next card is the Pollen Shield Hair. It is a rabbit for two banner, uh, white color. Creature tokens you control get plus one plus one. 
and um, it is a two to body. So buffs all your tokens. So predestinated for a token deck. It also has has a adventure ability on it. Um, adventure sorcery, the hair raising. Target creature you control gains vigilance and gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. So kind of cool. Give this, for example, to a flyer or other um, big threat. So really like this uh, card. Buffs all your creatures. So definitely uh, you want to include this card in a token deck. Um, yeah, what uh, are some cards you can um yeah combine this word would be wedding announcement should be a good addition to it add a line for sure then we have the moonshaker cavalry we discussed earlier good addition then um the regal bunny corn um also a card um we'll discuss later benefits from it so yeah this card has yeah i guess a lot of play in a token stack um so yeah really like it so if you're into tokens you can definitely rate this a 7 out of 10 and can definitely spend 2 to 4 wild cards on it. So, next card is the Questing Druid. It is a um, human druid for 2 mana in green colors. And whenever you cast a spell that's white, blue, black, or red. So, everything beside the green, then you can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the Questing Druid. So this makes him good in a multicolor deck to buff him, make him a big threat. But it also has the Seek the Beast and Adventure Instant. Excite the top two cards of your library until the next end step, you may play those cards. So this is basically um, yeah, a Rent's Resolve at instant speed. So pretty, pretty cool, this effect. So combined together, it is a Pretty good value card. Um, really like it. So you really get a ton of value. The human druid uh, can become a big threat. The seek the beast is a pretty good instant. Um, yeah, would rate this, uh, I guess, uh, a eight out of ten because it's so versatile. And yeah, I probably would spend two or three wild card. On this one because it is so versatile really fits in a lot of decks so yeah kind of like it okay the next one is the raging battle mouse for two mana you get a two one mouse creature so kind of sad that it is a mouse and not a rat so it would maybe fit good in a red deck but it is a mouse not sure why they did uh didn't make it a red so but it has the falling abilities. The second spell you cast each turn costs one less to cast. So this is pretty cool. So um, uh, in your turn and an opponent's turn, um, your second spell costs one less to cast. So a discount is always nice. And the Raging Battle Mouse has the celebration ability on it. Uh, if two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn, the creature you control gets plus one plus one until the end of turn. So yeah, celebration effect not super easy um, to make it, but with the um, discount of the raging battle mass, uh, it is easier to uh, to make. So. Kinda nice card, not super impressive. I would rate this card a uh, six out of ten. Um, can be a yeah good filler in some decks where you wanna get the discount uh, or in the celebration deck. So yeah, it is kind of nice to have. Um, personally, uh, personally, I was not sure about this. Um, if you wanna make a celebration. Uh, seem deck then uh, yeah you definitely could spend two or three copies of it um, yeah I guess nothing wrong about this creature so the next card is the rankless prank a sorcery for four mana you can choose one or more so you can even get all four, uh, three modes first mode is 
Each player discards two cards. Second mode, each player loses four life and each player sacrifices two creatures. So it is a pretty versatile card. Uh, downside is it always targets each player. So you would also discard two cards. Um, yeah, if you want to build around a discard deck, uh, yeah, maybe it has some play. And uh, each player loses for life is a pretty good combination with uh, what's the card? Um, Rowan. So if you, uh, yeah, cast the Rankless Prank uh, and have Rowan Scene of War on the battlefield, uh, you can discard opponent, um, yeah, discard yourself, um, maybe, and then, of course, you will lose for life, and then your black and red spells will X less to cast. So you can get a pretty cool, um, yeah, cost reduction from Rowan, a uh, scene of war in, um, yeah, in combination with Rankless Prank. So I guess the second mode, um, is kind of good in tradition, um, combined with Rowan. And the third mode, each player sacrifice two creatures. I guess it's kind of good if you include it, for example, in, uh, yeah, a token deck, uh, the roll token deck. Um, yeah, these kind of thing. Red Father would also make some sense, uh, make, uh, some sense. So you just sacrifice two of your red tokens. Opponent has to sacrifice some more valuable creatures. So yeah, pretty versatile card. But on the other hand, um, it is uh, also a situational card. So I'm not 100% sure about this. Um, because it is so versatile, I would give it a 5 out of 10. Um, because it only fits in certain deck types. So basically, if you like these deck types, the tokens, uh, the row tokens, a red tribal, for example, maybe some other card um, deck types, you can definitely uh, go for it. But if you're not into that uh, deck types, don't waste any um, white cards on it. If you're into that deck types, then maybe you can spend, yeah, I guess two copies of the Rankless Prank. So the next card is the Realm Scorcher Hellkite um, Dragon for six mana, for six body. It has haste in addition to flying, also has bargain. And when you pay the bargain cost, add four mana any combination of colors. And also the uh, Realm Scorched Hellkite has the ability for two mana to deal one damage to any target. So it is a super versatile card. So flying in haste for a 4-6 uh, dragon is not super impressive, but the bargain is really cool. So you basically just have to sacrifice uh, a food, a treasure token, some of the uh, roll tokens uh, or other tokens, and then you get an uh, additional Four mana in any combination of colors. So even you could even cast basically a multi a multi colored spell, a four colored spell. So pretty cool. Or you can cast a shelter tool uh, in addition to this card. So yeah, it has yeah a super huge value, and also the ability to deal one damage to any target is pretty good. There are some ways to reduce the costs um, of the active abilities, for example, the what was the name? Um, Agota, what, let me, yeah, Agata. So, yeah, this card is pretty good. It is expensive, but also it has a ton of value. So, I really get, like this card. So, all in all, I would rate this card pretty high, I would give it a nine out of ten. And yeah, um, for the wild cards, um, yeah, it's always the thing with um, high mana value cards. Uh, yeah, I guess I would spend two wild cards on it because you can include this in yeah some 
type of decks and it is pretty valuable so yeah definitely nothing wrong about spending two wild cards on the realm scorcher hellkite so the next card is the wet red cap gutter dweller a goblin warrior for four mana in red color it is a menace creature with a 3c body and when it enters the battlefield create two one one black red creature tokens which this creature can't block so for four mana you you basically have three creatures on the board one is a 3c with menace and two one ones who can't block so this alone is a super good value but it has has even more text on the card at the beginning of your upkeep you may sacrifice another creature if you do put a plus one plus one counter on red cap gutter dweller and excite the top card of your library you may play that card this turn so this also gives you the be uh, benefit to have a uh, value in exchange for a red token so this is pretty good value for four mana um create some bodies you sack uh some creatures get grow the red cup gutter dweller and you can even excite the top card of your library and play this uh, this turn so yeah there i guess are plenty of ways to include this card so i guess in a token deck a red trouble deck also a sacrifice deck would make some sense so yeah get a ton of value for it um yeah personally would rate this card 8 out of 10 so definitely a really cool card and definitely nothing wrong to spend three wild cards on this fella if you like yeah um the red trouble deck token decks sacrifice decks yeah just spend three wild cards on it uh, definitely worth it in my opinion so this is the regal bunny corn a rabbit unicorn i guess <laughs> um the only rabbit unicorn in the magic universe um uh, i would assume so this creature for two mana and white um has power and toughness equal to the number of non-land permanents you control so in worst cases it's just the word one but if you include this in a token deck or an aura enchantment or in any other kind of deck this one will become a huge threat so for example in the mono white deck we discussed earlier with the moonshaker cavalry this one will become super huge uh, and uh, also it fits in yeah in a couple of other decks so yeah uh, token decks for example the aura and enchantment decks it is pretty good so yeah this card is very versatile so i guess you will see this in yeah in a lot of decks also the rolled tokens make a lot of sense for this card so yeah definitely this is an 8 out of 10 i guess you will see this yeah sometimes and yeah i would spend so if i were you and you like the tokens or the new Roll token mechanic or the aura and enchantment decks definitely uh nothing wrong to spend three or four wild cards on it but because the opponent has to deal with this card because otherwise it become a uh, super huge so yeah definitely a good card so next is the first land from the set the restless oh man not sure how to pronounce this correctly by walk not sure uh, <laughs> what's the right pronunciation. So it is a dual land in borrowed colors. And as the battlefield tapped, but uh, you can tap it for um, yeah, red or white. Uh, and it has the ability for three mana and borrowed colors to become a 2-2 red and white ox creature until the end of turn. It's still a land. Whenever the rest of the bivouac we walk attacks put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control so you can target itself or other creature so this is a really nice little land so if you um yeah face the board wipe uh, all your creatures are gone or it's uh, your opponent removed all your creature uh, with removal spells 
This can become uh, one of your last creatures, uh, and it can become uh, it, it constantly can grow. So this is pretty nice. Also, it's kind of immune to board wipes because most board wipes, uh, I guess, all board wipes are sorceries. So this is a kind of nice little addition in aggressive decks. So yeah, I would rate this a seven out of ten. Um, definitely can include one or two copies in some kind of decks, uh, definitely in a Jeskai deck, uh, Boros or Bardo, uh, definitely makes some sense. So yeah, definitely a good, nice little land creature. So the next one is the Restless, Restless Cottage. Also a Doodle Land in Golgari colors, uh, also enters the battlefield tapped and has the active ability for four mana this time. And it is a 4-4 black and green horror creature until the end of turn, also still a land. And when it attacks, create a food token exile up to one target uh, creature from a graveyard. So also kind of nice. So reminds me of the uh, Hive of the Eye Tyrant. Uh, works similar way. Um... It is kind of expensive, but you also get a 4-4 four four, and you create a um, food token and have some graveyard hit. So nice little addition. Definitely would rate this a 6 or 6.5. Um, definitely can include this in all Golgari, Sultai or Junt decks. Um, yeah, definitely can spend one or two wild cards on this one. So next one is the Restless Fortress. Also a dual land restless fortress enters the battlefield tapped at for cause of color and can also activate it uh, for four mana becomes a one four white and black nightmare creature until the end of turn it's still a land and whenever uh, the fortress attacks the fennec player loses two life and you gain two life so compared to the restless uh Cottage, uh, I personally find this one mm, worse because you just get a 1 4 body um, for 4 mana. Uh, the Gagari uh, dual land uh, gets your 4 4. And yeah, I guess um, to create a food token and uh, have some graveyard hate uh, is at least as good as to drain the opponent for 2 life and gain 2 life. So it is kind of nice, but I find it personally worse than the, uh, the Gagari uh, Dual Land. So I would rate this a 5 out of 10. Uh, definitely can include it in Orzov, Orzov style deck, Madu, uh, or an Esper deck. But yeah, one or two copies are enough in my opinion. Next one is the Restless Spire. Also Dune Land, uh, is it? Tapped Land. You can tap for blue or red. And for two mana uh, in is it colors, you can transform the Restless Spire until the end of turn into a 2-1 blue and red elemental creature with, as long as it's your turn, this creature has first strike. It's still a land. And whenever Restless Spire attacks, scry one. So yeah. Also kind of nice, nice to have, but not super important. Um, yeah, the two one is pretty fragile, so not sure about this. Um, definitely can uh, include uh, one or two copies in. Yeah, and is it um, uh, Grixis or yeah, Jeskai decks, but. Um, I would personally rate it a 5 or a 4.5. And yeah, can include one, but yeah, probably not more, maybe two. So the last dual land, the Restless Vinestalk. Uh, enders tapped like all dual lands in this format, then add a green or a blue. And for five mana, you can transform it until the end of turn into a 5 5 green and blue plant creature. Wood Trample. It's still a land, and whenever it attacks, up to one target creature has base power and toughness 3-3 three, three until the end of turn. So, yeah, 
So, yeah, this card, yeah, is pretty nice. So, 5-5 five, five is kind of nice. It also has trample. So, this one can uh, apply the finishing blow for the opponent. Also can buff one of your creatures from 1-1 uh, one, one into a 3-3. Three, three. So, uh, yeah, in some games, maybe this is the final blow you have um, for the opponent. So, I kind of like it, so I would rate this higher, maybe a 5.5 5, uh, 5 .5 out of 10. It is kind of hard because 5 mana is pretty much, uh, so you want to only do this if you're out of cards uh, or really uh, some certain situations. So yeah, could spend one or two wild cards in yeah, a Simic band or a Sulta deck, uh, or maybe a, t a Timor deck. So yeah, kind of nice addition, I guess. So the next one is the uh, Rotisserie Elemental. Not sure about the pronunciation. Forgive me, guys and girls. So this is an elemental creature for one mana. It has menace. And whenever deals combat damage to a player, put a skewer counter on the rotisserie elemental, then you may sacrifice it. If you do, excite the top X cards of your library access the number of skewer counters on this elemental, and you may play those cards this turn. So I'm not super sure about this creature. So in the early turns, um, maybe you can deal some damage uh, against some control players for sure, but they're also likely to remove this creature to deny you the value, uh, to deny you the value. But against other creature decks, um, the menace makes it hard to block in the early turns. So if you can play this out in the early turns, maybe you can get some value out of it. On the other hand, if you draw into this card, for example, on turn four, you really doesn't uh, really don't really benefit from it uh, at all because um, uh, at this time of the game, the opponent mostly has some creatures out. Um, they can block the elemental with ease, and then you don't get any value at all. So um, yeah, I'm really not sure if this card really. Um, yeah, will become meta or will be included in mono red decks. Um, I guess you can try it out, but um, on the other hand, uh, I personally wouldn't rate it too high. So my guess is, yeah, I guess as a two-sided sword on the early turns. Yeah, it can do some damage and um, you can sack it to get some value out of it, but on a later turn it is pretty useless. So I would just rate it a 3 or 4 out of 10. And if you're one red player and want to give it a try, maybe spend one or two wild cards on it, but I'm not sure. Definitely, um, personally, I wouldn't spend a wild card on this one, in my opinion. So the next card is Rowan, the sign of war. So for three mana in Rector's Colors, you get a 4-2 menace human wizard legendary creature. So uh, two toughness is mm, mm, uh, maybe easy to deal with for the opponent, just needs to play with fire. So not the best body, um, so, but also has the ability, so you can tap it, especially cast this turn, are black, and that are black or red, cost X less to cast, where X is the amount of life you lost this turn, activate only as a sorcery. This is kind of interesting ability. So cost reduction is always kind of nice and really can benefit in you, can, really benefit you in the early turns. So uh, in my, understa my understanding, this will only reduce um, the cost of generic mana. 
and you have to yeah lose some life in your turn because you can only activate as a sorcery so how do you make most use out of it yeah to make most use out of it you have to really um yeah um build a deck around it that focusing on uh to lose some life for example um, what cards do we have that lose some life i guess you have the phyrexian arena um what was the one card uh lord skitter's blessing that also uh, uh loses you one life at the uh, beginning of your turn and draws your card maybe gigs would be a card uh, if you have some creatures on the battlefield and do some combat damage then you can also lose some life and draw cards and then with Rowan on the turn you could um yeah get a, a discount uh we also discussed earlier rank is prank so you could play the so for example you have the Rowan scene of war on turn three out and on turn four Four, you play the rankles prank everybody loses some life you lose four life then uh, you activate rowan's uh, sign of war and you get a hefty discount of four so mm, you really yeah could cast some other stuff on that turn but I guess the most or the best combination with this card should be, um, yeah, some other stuff, um, uh, which doesn't cost you too much mana and lose you, so, uh, lose some life. So I guess the Phyrexian Arena and Lord Skitter's Blessing is, I guess, the best cards uh, combined with it. So. I guess it is really kind of hard to make this card uh, look super good. So I would rate this just a 7 or 7.5. It has a good ability. I really like the ability, but um, to lose life in standard, um, there aren't that many cards. So it is not uh, easy to assemble. So I would just give it a 7 or 7.5. Um, Maybe there are some deck combinations that, um, yeah, uh, can make a successful build about Rhone, a sign of war. Um, if you want to focus on trying, then I guess, uh, definitely can, um, yeah, spend two or three wild cards on Rhone. Otherwise, um, I won't, wouldn't spend any wild cards if you don't believe that, uh, the lose life mechanic, uh, can work. So the next card is the Scalding Viper. So for two mana, you get the Elemental Snake. Also has an adventure on it. It is a 2-1 uh, snake. And whenever a opponent casts a spell with mana value 3 or less, the Scalding Viper, Scalding Viper deals one damage to that player. So it will constantly deal damage to the opponent. So it is pretty good. But is it really better than um, any constant uh, damage creature like, uh, what's the name, the prowess creature uh, Mono Red has that uh, deals one damage if they uh, cast instant and sorcery? Not for sure. Um, yeah. I'm really not sure is if this creature is super impactful um then uh, let's discuss about uh adventure sorcery so it is the steam clean for two mana you can bounce a non land permanent to its owner's hand pretty okay always kind of nice it is a sorcery this kind of sucks don't know why it is a sorcery um so i personally think this card is okay but not super impactful um sure um this can uh, drain the opponent uh, or deal the opponent a lot of damage but in most cases opponent will deal with it or stop uh, casting uh, a ton of 
uh, mana values per three or less. So I'm not sure if this is, yeah, a super impactful card or will be seen a lot of in the meta. So I personally would rate this just a six out of 10. It is okay, but not, not that super great. So if you really like um, or are, if you're into a uh, is it seam decks, Grixis, or I don't know, um, Jeskai decks, maybe you can give it a try. Um, then if you want to give it a try, you can uh, spend honestly two or three wild cards on it without a doubt. But I'm not sure if I would spend any wild card on this, to be honest. So next card is the Sentinel of the Lost Lore. So for three mana with double green, you get an Elf Knight and a 3-4 body. This alone is pretty good, but it also has an ETB effect and you can choose one or more. So you can even choose three modes on it. So the first mode is return target card you own in exile that has adventure to your hand. So this basically means you can cast uh, an adventure on yeah, any turn. Uh, and with this one, you can return the exile card to your hand and you can recast the adventure. So this is a pretty good value. The second mode is put target card. You don't own in exile. It has adventure on the bottom of your if it's owner's library also kind of good and then there's the exile targets players graveyard so also has some graveyard hate so this is pretty good card not gonna lie so in um, adventure theme deck this definitely has some play so if you want to go and play the adventure deck mm, i would definitely rate this an 8 out of 10 because of its versatility. So how many wild cards would I spend on it? So I would definitely play the new adventure uh, steam deck. So uh, I guess I will definitely spend at least two to three wild cards on it. So the next one is the sleep cursed fairy. So for one blue mana, you get a 3-3 flying war 2 creature. This alone makes this creature super good. But the Sleep Cursed Fairy enters the battlefield tab with three stun counters on it. And it has the ability to untap the Sleep Cursed Fairy for two mana. So, a uh, flying war 2 body for what mana um, is pretty good. But uh, it, so for example, you play this on turn one, then um, the three stun counters are, um, yeah, I guess until four or five, uh, this creature won't do anything for you. Sure, you can pl uh, go for the ability to untap the sleep cursed fairy, but uh, you also, um, yeah, have to activate this several times. So I'm not sure about this creature. It takes a lot of invest to make this creature work. And, and for this mana, I guess you can do several other things. So I personally mm, don't really like this creature. It is kind of okay, but uh, it needs so much effort, so I would just rate this a 5 out of 10. Maybe this works in uh, any way. Yeah, I'm not sure about this. Um, uh, Standard also doesn't have the ability to remove counters from one creature to other, um, in my opinion. So... Uh, I personally wouldn't spend any wild card on it. If you think uh, it was worth to play it out on turn one and I guess on turn five uh, have a 3-3 flyer, then yeah, can't spend uh, 
two or three wild cards on it, but personally, um, there are better cards out there. So in my opinion, don't waste the wild cards on this one. So the next card is the Song of Totem Tans. So this is a sorcery um, for one red mana and X in its cost. And you create X, what one, black, red. Creature tokens with this creature can't block and creatures you control gain haste until the end of turn. So, uh, interesting card. Reminds me of Awaken the Woods. In a kind of other way. So, these uh, uh, will mostly deal damage uh, compared to the Awaken the Woods. Um, if you manage to buff all your creatures, for example, um, the wedding announcement uh, or... Um, there were some other enchantment buffs that buffs your creatures. Um, yeah, you can create um, yeah a solid force of red creatures. So the yeah can deal the necessary damage to um, yeah make a finishing blow to the opponents. So it can be a good addition. So I personally would rate this a six point five out of ten. And in a red tribal deck, um, if you want to play or are into in the direct tribal deck or also maybe a token deck, then you can definitely just spend two or three wild cards in my opinion. So the next card is the Spectre of Mortality. So it's a Spectre for five mana. You get a flying 3C body. That alone is not too impressive, but it has the enter the battlefield mechanic. And uh, when it enters the battlefield, you may exile any one or more creature cards from your graveyard. So you can choose. And when you do, each other creature you control gets minus X minus X until the end of turn. Where X is the number of uh, cards exiled this way. So to get the real benefit out of this card, uh, you have to have some creature cards in your uh, graveyard um, and yeah you basically have an adjustable board wipe um, you can delete um, yeah mostly all other creatures if you want to but you also can just delete um, for example smaller creatures so I guess against all the red tokens roll tokens uh, or other little stuff this can be really a good card and Mono Black decks or Golgari Grixis or whatever you want to play. It. So I really like this card. I think it's pretty good. You have to have some creature cards in your graveyard. Otherwise it isn't, you don't get the full value out of it. Um, have to remember that. So I personally would give this card a nine out of 10. And personally, yeah, I kind of like this card. So definitely would spend two or three wild cards on it. If you want to have, yeah, a versatile board wipe. So yeah, kind of good card. So the next one is the Spellbook Vendor. A uh, human pleasant for two mana. Get a 2-2 body with vigilance. And at the beginning of your combat, on your turn, you may pay one. When you do, create a sorcerer roll token attached to target creature you control. So let's look. Uh, sorcerer roll token. So the enchanted creature gets plus one plus one and has whenever this creature attacks, try one. So this alone is pretty good. So you can scry and you can constantly create these roll tokens. So remember, um, you can just um, attach one roll token to one of your creatures. So a creature can't have more than one roll tokens. I have to remember that, but you constantly make tokens and you buff your creatures for one mana every turn. So this is a pretty versatile card. So you can combine this with a couple of other cards. So for example, um, we had the Archon. Um, what was his name? Let's. So this one is a pretty good addition to it. Other creatures you control that enchanted by ours you control have base power plus four plus four and have flying. So here you are. So 
if you um, can get some roll, uh, roll tokens out uh, until turn four, you can yeah make some tokens and then with the Archon out, they all have flying uh, get buffed from because of the sorcery roll tokens. So yeah, this is pretty cool. Other cool cards um, um, combined with it would be um, I guess. The Tale of the Ages, the Sugar Maw would be good. Then the uh, Elfish uh, 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 Archivist uh, would be good. So because of its um, enchantment trigger ability, then Ariad would be good. Then we have the Fawnsbane Troll. So I guess the uh, Epson deck, you can give um, the Fawnsbane Troll um yeah constantly a aura attached to it um the troll becomes a firefight with trample can attack can sack the road token can fight a creature so there's really a ton uh yeah of cards that um yeah can combine with the spellbook vendor and because of this versatility i would give this card yeah i guess uh Nine out of ten, so this is super versatile and can include this in a lot of decks. Red tokens benefit, roll tokens, um, tokens in general. So yeah, enchantments, aura decks. So this is a pretty cool card. So you yeah can really spend two of uh, two to four copies of it and yeah without a doubt. So this is a pretty good card in a lot of decks. Definitely we'll see this more uh, this often. So the next one is the Spiteful Hexbench. For, so for one mana you get a 3-2 body. This alone is pretty good. But when it enters the battlefield, create a Cursed Roll Token attached to target creature you control. So the Cursed Roll Token transforms your one of your creature into a 1-1. One, one. So if you have a red token out, um, it would be ideal because you can enchant the uh, red token um, and the spiteful hex mage uh, still is a three uh, three two body for one mana, so pretty good. But this also makes some sense in all bargain um, decks because you can sacrifice the cursed roll token. Um, so yeah, there is definitely some play for this card. So. I would rate this, um, yeah, 6.5 out of 10. Um, you definitely can spend uh, two or three wild cards on this human warlock without a doubt. Um, it is versatile, so yeah, kind of like it. So the next one is the Sir Ginger, the uh, Meal Ender. Pretty funny card. It is, uh, I guess, a cookie. I'm not sure what it is. It is a food knight. Legendary artifact creature, so for two mana you get a 3-1. And Sir Ginger, the meal ender has trample, hexproof, hay and haste, as long as an opponent controls a planeswalker. So I guess a planeswalk hunter. Mm. And whenever another artifact you control is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter um, on Sir Ginger and scribe one. So Whenever another artifact you control is put into graveyard. So, um, treasure and food tokens don't go to the graveyard. So this won't to apply to them. So you have really have permanent, uh, yeah, spell, uh, artifact spells that go to the graveyard. Um, I can't think of a lot of, uh, artifacts that go to the graveyard. Um, to buff the Sir Ginger. Mm, then Sir Ginger has also ability. You can sack um, Sir Ginger. You gain life to equal to its power. So in best way you want to buff Sir Ginger's uh, power. But with this ability, I guess it's not that easy. Um, yeah. To go for it because there aren't that many artifacts that can go to the graveyard. Uh, in my opinion, so um, I'm not convinced about this card, so I would just give this a 3 out of 10 for uh, Sir Ginger. Um, 
personally don't spend any wild cards on it. Maybe there is a an historic brawl or historic uh yeah a way to make this card uh, look good but yeah also for hunting planeswalker um you can just block it with um a bigger creature so uh it doesn't have um death touch uh, so just a normal creature can block it and yeah uh the fun is gone so yeah not convinced from this creature. So the next one is Taliot's Messenger. So for three mana you get a um, Fairy Noble, one, two, uh, one, three flying Fairy Noble. And it also have, uh, whenever you attack with one or more fairies, draw a card, then discard a card. Whenever you discard a card this way, put a plus one, plus one counter on target fairy you control. So. In best cases, you have a fairy out on turn two, play this on turn three, attack with um, one or more fairies, then you can loot, draw and discard, and you can buff one of your fairies, um, they will grow. So yeah, um, opponent has to deal uh, in some way with this card, otherwise it will constantly uh, draw you into the right cards and will become bigger and bigger so definitely is a threat for the opponent also because it is flying so not easy to block mono green hates flyers so i would personally rate this a 10 out of 10 so the looting ability is always nice always good to draw into the stuff you need and to fill uh send out your deck um the constant pressure because it grows is pretty good so yeah Definitely can grab two or three copies of the Talion's Messenger. So next one is Ta Ta uh, Talion, the Kindly Lord. So it is a fairy noble for four mana in Demir colors, flying three for body. That uh, um, alone makes him pretty good, but wait for his ability. As Talion, the Kindly Lord, enters the battlefield, choose a number between one and ten. Whenever opponent casts a spell, with mana value, power, or toughness equal to the chosen number, that player loses two life and you draw a card. This makes this card super insane, in my opinion. So, in the worst cases, you name two, opponent will remove this card with, for example, Infernal Grasp or go for the throat, and you draw uh, a card uh, and opponent loses two life. But what if you can protect this card for example with um a fading hope or a spell pierce or make disappear or any other spell opponent uh, in cases of the fading hope or what is the one that uh, makes you phase out has to um uh, yeah uh, cast another removal spell so you can <laughs> get another card out of it uh, if opponent is willing to commit uh, a second removal spell so this card is pretty good not pretty good it is super good and if opponent doesn't have a ton of removal um maybe you're facing mono white uh, mono white ha have hasn't destroyed you yet um, and uh, opponent just plays, um, yeah, all the creatures out with, uh, for example, power two or three, and you named two or three, then you will draw so many cards out of it, and opponent will lose so many life. So, I guess uh, the best number uh, always to name is two or three, because most removals are two or three, and um, most creature power toughness has two or three so i would suggest you name these but always depends um when you cast this bar but uh with a lower number the chances are higher that uh you will get the trigger from um talion the kindly lord so this card is really super huge um yeah it reminds me of sheltered but also can draw cards so 
Uh, I would say it is can can become a uh, yeah uh, a huge threat like Charlotte. So opponent will definitely have to deal with this card. Otherwise, the game will run away. So in my opinion, this is definitely a 9.5. Definitely, uh, yeah, one of the best cards. Uh, so definitely, I will spend three or. Maybe uh, four wild cards on it because it is just super strong. Um, like Sheldred, Sheldred dominated um, the whole meta, and I think this card can also do it. So, really a fan of it. And yeah, you definitely will see this card a lot of times. So, next card is the Tangled Colony. Uh, it is a red creature, a 3 to body. Uh, for two mana, but it can't block. So this is the downside of this card. But when it dies, you create X plus one plus one black red creature tokens with this creature can't block. X is the amount of damage dealt to it this turn. But this is an interesting card. So if you want to try the red tribal deck out, you definitely have to include this. But this also makes uh, yeah sense in some other ways. It is a good addition because when it dies, you can create some tokens. So it's also kind of good in a token deck. Um, uh, in the best cases, this will deal some damage and the opponent will finally have to block it. Um, and if opponent doesn't have a good blocker for it, so a good blocker uh, for it would be just um, a creature with power two so that you will just get uh, two red tokens out of it but for example if opponent just has one big creature and is low on life and has to block the um, tangled colony then you get uh, yeah a huge amount out of it so this is really kind of nice in the worst way opponent will just yeah play a uh, a uh, mono black removal spell on it, which don't deal damage. But for example, mono red ha has not the ability to do this. So if they destroy it, you would get at least, um, yeah, I guess, uh, with a play on fire two out of on this creature. With a uh, lightning strike, you even get three um, black red creature tokens out of it. So yeah, I really kind of like this card. Um, downside, like I said, is that it can't block, but it really fits in a token or in a red tribal deck. So I would rate this card definitely a 7 out of 10. And yeah, if you like tokens and a red tribal deck and want to try this out, then yeah, I guess you definitely can spend 2 to four of these, um, yeah, red creatures. Nothing wrong about it. So next card is the Apprentice Follies, a saga for four mana in is it color? Three chapters, chapter one and two. Choose target non-token creature you control that doesn't have the same name as a token you control. Create a token that's a copy of it, except that isn't legendary is a reflection in addition to its other types and it has haste. So let's discuss the first two chapters. So to make the most use out of it, you want to copy a strong creature, for example, a dragon or any big creature. It gains haste. Uh, so also can copy a legendary, which become a, a non-legendary token. So for chapter two, you have to remind that you can't um, copy um, the same creature if the token um, you created on chapter one uh, did stay on the battlefield. You so you have to create an, a token of another creature. Um, and chapter uh, three, unfortunately, we have to sacrifice all reflections. So it's a pretty interesting card but um yeah is it the right one to craft i'm not sure because you have sac to sacrifice all the reflections you control um 
kind of really hard to tell. Um, maybe uh, in historic there's a combo where you can remove saga count uh, saga counters from this uh, from the apprentice uh, forty. Then you would uh, create constantly copies of um, yeah of creatures you control. So this would be very good. But in standard, um, I guess in most cases you will have to sacrifice all your reflections on turn three. Um, but maybe if you have a dragon or maybe two dragons out there and can, you can cast this, then uh, you can copy one of these uh, or both these bad boys. And then, yeah, um, it really can pressure the opponent because of the haste ability. Um, so it is a kind of nice card, very situational. You have to have some good creatures on the battlefield. Otherwise it won't do anything good. So this is really applicable in later turns. And I'm not sure if the meta is uh, super fast um, or will be slower. Not sure about it, but um, yeah. I guess it makes more sense in the later turns when you have some um, bodies or uh, huge bodies on a battlefield. So I personally would rate it a 6, point, uh, 6 out of 10. Definitely has some niche potential. Uh, I guess nothing uh, wrong to spend one or two wild cards on it. Yeah, but uh, if you don't like is it decks, uh, definitely you also don't miss anything if you don't spend any wild cards on this one. So the next card is the end. So for four mana, you get an instant and you get the discount of two if your life is five or less. So it becomes better um, if you're low on life. And what does it? So excite target creature or planeswalker. So this is already good to exile a um, creature or planeswalker. For four mana is pretty solid. Um, and with a discount, uh, it's even better. And then it has another ability. Search its controller, graveyard, hand, and library. For any number of cards with the same name as the permanent, exile them. That player shuffles, then draws a card for each card exiled from their hand. This way. So... If opponent has a key card in his hand for maybe an Ash York, so you deal with Ash York um, on the turn, on your turn or their turn, uh, whenever you want, um, you exile Ash York and also get rid of all other Ash Yorks in graveyard, hand, or in the library. So you can shut down, um, yeah. A game plan pretty good if it doesn't get countered. So this card I really like in a control style deck. So oftentimes certain decks are built around uh, one or two key cards. And if you take these key cards away, um, opponent's deck is way, uh, um, yeah, less threatening to you. If you, yeah, get rid of their most, um, important cards. So I really, really like this card. So for every control player, um, yeah, should definitely get uh, some couples of this card. So my personal rating, uh, um, I would rate this a uh, 8.5 out of 10. So the exile effect alone is pretty good. The cost reduction makes this super good. And the exile effect uh, for all the other copies, uh, yeah, Turns is a really, really good card. So um, for all control players, um, yeah, uh, I would definitely go. Um, yeah, you can definitely spend two or three wild cards on that without a doubt. It is a pretty good card. So the next card is the Goose Mother, a legendary Bird Hydra. Um, <laughs> pretty strange combination of Bird Hydra. So it is a 2-2 two -two body with flying. For, um, yeah, two Simic um, mana and X in its cost. And the Goose Mother enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. 
When the goose mother enters the battlefield, create half X food tokens, round it up. And whenever the goose mother attacks, you may sacrifice a food. If you do, draw a card. So this has a ton of text on it. So um, a 2-2 body with flying for two mana is solid. But the real benefit is if you can create a buff uh, the goose mother with uh, some counters on it so in a later turn it becomes better because uh, it will yeah you will get a huge uh, flyer out of it and you will create i guess at least one or two or maybe more food tokens and whenever the goose mother attacks you may sacrifice a food if you do draw a card also kind of nice you have a card draw engine uh, if you manage uh, that the goose mother stay alive, not always easy uh, in a removal heavy meta, but yeah, I kind of like this card. So for Simic players, this is definitely a really cool card. Also, another yeah, uh, color combinations: Temur, um, Sultai, or Band. This is a pretty good card. The card draw makes yeah makes it a threat. Um, that opponent, um, yeah, want to deal with it. Also, uh, a huge flyer out is always kind of good and threatening the opponent. So, a uh, nice little card. Um, so I would definitely rate this a uh, seven or seven point five out of ten. Um, personally, if in my opinion, if you like um, these kind of decks I mentioned, uh, you can definitely spend, um, yeah two or three wild cards on the goose mother nothing wrong to yeah you, um, that you can um, have a huge flyer out and have a card engine so definitely a good card so the next card is the huntsman the huntsman's redemption a saga for three mana so on chapter one you create a three three green beast creature token this alone would make this card okay. Then on chapter two, you may sacrifice a creature. If you do, search your library for a creature or a basic land card, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle. So you basically have a tutor effect if you are willing to sacrifice a creature. So in the best circumstances, you can maybe sacrifice, uh, yeah, a smaller creature like, um, I don't know, um, one of the smaller ram creatures, um, a red token, another small token, I don't know. And you search uh, for your, the creature card of your choice. So this is pretty good. Also pretty good in a combo deck where you need to apply uh, a certain combo with a creature. And on chapter three, up to two target creatures uh, each get plus two plus two and gain trample until the end of turn so also kind of nice so makes your um yeah for example medium-sized creature into some yeah bigger threats with trample so this is kind of nice card so yeah kind of like it uh, i guess you can include this card in several different decks um yeah fits maybe in mono green as well as in enchantment decks can yeah search for yeah mm, Jukai naturalist or any other enchantment uh, creature you wanna out or calyx or whatever you want so pretty nice little card uh, so I would personally rate it a seven out of ten definitely a good card and if you're into enchantments mono green. Yeah, definitely can spend without a doubt two or four wild cards. Uh, two, two, four wild cards on this card. Pretty good. So, next card is the Iron Craig. So, for two men, you get a legendary artifact, uh, Rams. Yeah. This is kind of nice. So, we don't have that many ramp um, artifacts in standard, but you can only. Ramp for a colorless mana and has another ability. Uh, whenever a legendary other uh, creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may have the Iron Crack become a legendary equipment artifact named Everflame. 
Hero's Legacy. If you do, it gains equip 3 and equipped creature gets plus 3 plus 3 and loses all other abilities. Hmm. Kind of interesting, but also kind of weird. So because uh, so when a legendary enters the battlefield, you can uh, transform the iron crack into equipment. The equipment is now uh, equipment for to equip with three and buffs the creature for plus three plus three. But um, all, uh, the legendary creature loses all other abilities. So this is not super huge. And you also, um, yeah, I don't know if you really want to transform uh, the iron crack into an equipment. So um, I personally don't like all equipment decks. So um, personally, I find this more or less pretty useless. I would just rate it a three out of 10. And I personally wouldn't spend any wildcard on it. Um, if you are into equipments, maybe you want to include it, but I'm not sure about this. So the next card is three blind mice. Also a saga for three mana uh, in white colors. Um, has four chapters. Chapter one, you create a one one white mouse creature token chapter two or three create a token that's a copy of target token you control in the last chapter creatures you control get plus one plus one and gain vigilance until the end of turn okay this is an interesting card so for, uh, in the worst cases you will just get um i guess in the worst case you create a token, the opponent removes the token, and then you don't get anything on chapter 2 or 3. This would be the worst possible situation. The best situation probably would be um, you create on chapter 1 uh, the 1-1 one, one token. On chapter 2 or 3 you can create a token, uh, uh, you can copy uh, a token of uh, another token you control, but this would be a better token, um, maybe a 3-3 golem token or uh, anything that is bigger, mm, maybe in the Jeskai deck, the, uh, the Prentin's Foley, uh, you could target one of their tokens, so yeah, it is a um, situational card, I have to admit. Uh, the buff uh, ability is kind of nice in a uh, token creation deck. So I guess in a deck where, yeah, in a token uh, deck, uh, when you have a wedding announcement out or other stuff, you have a lot of tokens out uh, and the buff on chapter four is pretty good. But um, chapter two or three can yeah, can uh, have some potential uh, if you can uh, create other better tokens. So it is an interesting card. Uh, maybe it has uh, some niches where it belongs. So um, because it's so situational, I would rate this a 6 out of 10. And if you like token decks, uh, I would say you could definitely spend two wild cards on it. Okay, this is the Sunderer's debut for so for eight mana, so pretty hefty price. You get a sorcery, it has bargain, so you can sack a artifact enchantment token as you cast a spell. And you look at the top 20 cards, so to dig 20 cards deep is pretty, yeah, pretty deep. And you will rare up to two creature cards from among them. If the spell was bargained, put the revealed cards onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put the revealed cards into your hand. Then shuffle. So, um, without the bargain, uh, the card definitely, uh, yeah, would be too unimpactful just to grab two creature cards. So, if you want to play it, you have to ensure to, um, yeah, that you bargain the spell. Uh, with bargain you can 
Yeah, put th uh, some uh, two bomb creatures out for free. Um, so, for example, you get out a Tali, a Truxa, or whatever. So then, yeah, the cost is, yeah, pretty good. But on the other hand, it is eight mana. So eight mana is pretty hefty um, cost. So um, I guess you just can include this card in a kind of ramp style deck. So, for example, if you can, uh, yeah, put some ramp creatures out like a Scrap Gorger or Invasion of Zendika, this card definitely has some play. But, um, yeah, it's, yeah, eight mana is hefty. So, yeah, it, uh, I would personally rate it just a six out of ten. Um, because of its price, um, if you can, uh, if you can resolve it, then um, probably it will end the game. Uh, if opponent can't deal with it, and in most cases uh, he will probably not. Um, yeah, so six out of ten, in my opinion, can spend one or two if you are uh, yeah into the big creature uh, deck types. Uh, you like to play your Atalis. Uh, Atraxas and all the big creatures for free. Um, yeah, then this is kind of your card. So it is kind of cool, but expensive. That's, yeah, the really downside of this card. So next one is the Twining Twins. So for four mana, you get a Fairy Wizard, a 4-4 four -four body with flying, vigilance, and what one. This alone makes this creature pretty cool. Um, insane stats. So this alone uh, would make this a rare, in my opinion, but it also has an instant adventure um, in form of the Swift Sparrow. So for two mana in white colors, you can exile target non-token creature. Return it to the battlefield under its owner control at the beginning of the next end step. So the inst uh, instant adventure is pretty good in a blink style deck but it also makes sense to protect your own creature so with for example talion in an esper deck you could protect um your talion against the removal uh, and will draw cards out of it so this would be pretty nice but also in a blink deck uh, where you benefit from the etb effect this can yeah have some play, so I really like this card. It is kind of versatile, so I really like it. Um, so personally, I would rate this a uh, seven, uh, seven out of ten. So definitely a good, ta a good card to invest your wild cards. Uh, so definitely, I will spend at least two wild cards on it because uh, I think. Um, this format definitely you can uh, make some blink decks, but also this is kind of good to protect your creatures. So yeah, this is a kind of good card. So definitely uh, you can at least uh, without a regret spend two wild cards on it. So next card is the Virtue of Courage. So it is a enchantment with the adventure on it. So. The um, instant adventure is the Emberas Blaze for two mana. The Emberas Blaze deals two damage to any target. So basically a more expensive uh, play with fire. Then enchantment side is uh, whenever source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent. You may exile that many cards from the top of your library. You may play those cards this turn. So yeah, a pretty good value from this card. But also this enchantment is kind of expensive. Opponent can remove it. So yeah, it is kind of nice, but uh, you have to invest uh, something into this card. Yeah, but... Um, so what would be some cards uh, to combine this with? So at the beginning, we talked about the Heart Flame Duelist. 
Uh, Imodain would be a good card uh, in combination with the virtue of the courage. Then we have Sulfim to buff uh, the damage. A Kassic Flame Breather would be a good uh, card in combination with this. Also, the Skaldic Viper kind of fits in this theme. So, yeah, there are some cards uh, you can combine this. But personally, uh, I find it kind of expensive. And also, I mm, really not like the uh, ability that you uh, just can play the exact cards this turn. Because in most cases, um, uh, you would deal some damage in your turn and opponent's turn. In your turn, it's okay, but in opponent's turn, you're mostly tapped out, uh, and then you can't uh, exile, um, you can't play the exiled cards because, uh, you, um, most cases not only hit, uh, instants, you will mostly hit lands or permanents, and you can't play this in, uh, opponent's turn because they don't have flash, so, yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong, it is a nice card, but I'm not really convinced about this card. So maybe there are, um, yeah, a deck type, uh, um, which is around, or, um, um, instant of sorcery, which deal damage. Uh, but personally, mm, I would just rate it a five out of 10. And if you like these kind of decks, sure, you can, um, I would spend two copies of it if you if I were you, if you really like these kind of decks. Okay, next is the Virtue of Knowledge. So and this one is also a permanent for five mana, blue color. It also has a, um, a instant adventure, the Ventress Vision for two mana and blue colors. And you can copy target activated or triggered ability you control. You may uh, choose uh, new targets for it. So this alone is a pretty cool effect. So for example, if you play Atali and you really have a uh, two mana extra open, you can, uh, yeah, copy this, uh, triggered abilities. So in certain scenarios, this can become a huge threat. So don't underestimate the Ventress uh, visions. Um, and then we have the enchantment itself. It, and uh, if a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers additional time. So Mono Blue has uh, now enchantment uh, Yeah, that gets an additional ETB trigger. So you can combine this with, yeah, in a blink deck. So imagine uh, also having uh, Elish Norn out and blinking, um, yeah, one uh, creature that has a really good ETB effect. Then, yeah, this is a pretty cool card. So if you like all the Yorian decks, um, this is, yeah, a nice little card. So I would rate this pers uh, personally pretty high, I would give this an 8 out of 10, because, yeah, blinking uh, can get some, yeah, huge value out of it, so I kind of like it. Uh, I also like the uh, blinking uh, style um, deck, so personally, I would, um, yeah, get one or two copies out of it, um, yeah. Okay, next is the Virtue of Loyalty, so for 5 mana. You get an enchantment, also has an instant adventure. The instant adventure is the Ardenvale uh, uh, Felty. Uh, for two mana, you can create a 2 to white knight token with vigilance. This is pretty okay, nothing special. And the enchantment, um, at the beginning of your end step, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. Untap those creatures. So this buffs all your creatures. So if you have many creatures out, um, this card can become a huge threat. And also you can go all in with the attacks <coughs> and still uh, get the untap from uh, the virtue of loyalty. So 
Um, yeah, you can go all in and untap. So this card is pretty cool. Fills an all token style decks, roll token, red token, uh, normal tokens. So pretty versatile card. I would rate it a 7.5, I guess, out of 10. And if you like token decks, I definitely would, yeah, get one or two copies of the Virtue of Loyalty. So the next one is the Virtue of Persistence. So a uh, seven mana enchantment with an a sorcery adventure. So the sorcery adventure for two mana is a removal spell um, and target creature and opponent controls. Uh, no, target creature gets minus three, minus three until the end of turn. You gain two life. So this alone is pretty good. So a removal spell for two um, to get rid of uh, three toughness creature is pretty good. And you also gain two life. Pretty solid. But the enchantment is, uh, yeah, the thing you really care about. So at the beginning of your upkeep, put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. So this is basically a portal to Phyrexia. A bit worse version um, of the portal to Phyrexia because opponent doesn't have to sack three creatures. But on the other hand, it's cheaper and it is more versatile because of the sorcery adventure. So a really, really cool card. Um, this probably has a, yeah, some play in some kind of uh, deck types. So a mill deck would benefit from it because uh, you could uh, get whatever creature out your opponent have, but also in a reanimator deck, this is really a really good card. So we constantly return one of your bigger threats in your graveyard. So definitely a cool card. So some kind, uh, some cards, um, I would imagine, uh, yeah, uh, would benefit from it. Um, would be maybe the Spirit Sister score in an enchantment stack. Um, then maybe we uh, paired up with a spiritual companion uh, would be nice. Uh, yeah, I guess there are some uh, yeah decks you can really include this card. So I would personally rate this card a eight out of ten. Um, I like reanimation uh, decks. Uh, if you also uh, like the reanimation decks, you can definitely spend two cards. Uh, Two wild cards on this card. Um, probably not more because of the hefty price of seven mana. Um, that is still very much. So I would personally not uh, spend more than two. But this is really a cool and fun card. So I really like it. So the next card is the Virtue of Strange. So for seven mana, you get an enchantment. Or with also an uh, adventure, a sorcery adventure on it. The Garen Brick grows. For one mana, you can return target creature or land card from your graveyard to your hand. So a nice little value. If opponent gets rid of one of your uh, cooler uh, creature cards, you can bring it back with this one. So always kind of nice in a mono green deck. So and the enchantment, if you tap a basic land for mana, it produces three times as much of that manners instead so um this is pretty cool this effect um you have to watch out it's just basic lands so you can't really um include this card uh, in um multicolored decks so i guess the most sense makes um the most sense uh, for this card uh, is in mono green. Then, yeah, because you you need the basic lands. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe you can do um, include this in a dual version. But you have to watch out that you include uh, more basic into it to get a full value out of it. But to produce uh, the triple of mana uh, is pretty. Pretty insane. So you, 
if you get this out, you basically um, will flood the opponent with uh, yeah some huge threat if you have um, still a, hand, a good hand. So yeah, I kind of like this. Uh, it is very expensive, so this is the downside, but it's definitely a strong enchantment. So personally, I would rate it an 8 out of 10. Um, these both cards, I guess. And yeah, if you are a mono green player, you like to ram, then yeah, definitely can spend one or two cards out of it. Okay, the next card is the Werefox Bodyguard. This is for three mana. You get an L Fox Knight. Crazy combination. It has flash. It has a two to body. When it enters the battlefield, except up to uh, one other target, non Fox. Very important. Creature until the Werefox Bodyguard leaves the battlefield. So you basically can uh, play this card in two ways. You can protect one of your creatures from a removal spell of the opponent. Or it is basically a Brutal Kassar with Flash. So, kind of cool. Will fit an aggressive mono white build. But also has some play in other, um, yeah, style decks. Uh, two ma uh, white mana is not too terrible in a dual color deck. So, um, yeah, this card is kind of nice. This will definitely, um, yeah, have some play in the meta. It also has the ability to sacrifice the uh, Werefox bodyguard and you gain two life. So you can instantly bring your creature back. So this is also kind of nice. Maybe there are certain ways where this will really become handy. So yeah, uh, definitely an interesting creature. So I would rate this uh, definitely uh, 7.5 out of 10. It's a pretty good card. Reminds me of the Brutal Kassar. Um, how many wild cards would I spend on it? So if, if you like mono white builds, aggressive builds, but also this... You can include this card in many, uh, many um, uh, decks. So yeah, you can definitely spend two to four cards on the Werefox Bodyguard. Okay, next one is the Wildwood Mentor. So for three mana, you get a 1-1. One, one. So for three mana for 1-1, one, one, isn't particularly great. So it is kind of fragile. Um, and whenever a token enters the battlefield under your control, Put a plus one plus one counter on the white wall, Whitewood Mentor. So the um, the, uh, the Whitewood Mentor will constantly grow if you include this in a token deck. So it will become a huge threat if opponent can't deal with it. So this is kind of nice. So and the second ability, whenever the Whitewood Mentor attacks, another target creature gets plus X plus X until the end of turn where X is the Whitewood Mentor's power. So, the early turns, it doesn't really be uh, uh, benefit uh, another creature very much, but on the later turns, when this grows, um, it can become a huge threat. So, the Whitewood Mentor is pretty good, not gonna lie. So, I would rate it a 7, seven out of 10. Um, not higher because... Um, in the early turns, opponent can um, yeah deal with it um, uh, relatively easy because of its ward toughness. So yeah, but it is a threat. Opponent has to deal with it. Otherwise, it can end some games. So um, if you if you like token decks, I would say you definitely can spend two or three wild cards on this card because you have. Oh, yeah, you have a, saw, uh, a force that opponent has to deal with. Okay, next card is Will, Sign of Peace. So the counterpart Drone. So for three mana, you get a legendary human wizard with vigilance, two for body. So I like the stats better than Rowan. Um, Mono Red has a harder time to deal with uh, Will than with Rowan. Um, and it also, Will has also the ability to. Uh, reduce the costs of white or blue spells um, uh, equal to the amount of life you gain this turn. Only at a sorcery speed, but for example, 
if you pair this up with li uh, some life gainers, um, um, for example, Ariad or other life gain effects, um, yeah, you get a really nice discount for your spells. So I really like this card. Um, I guess there are not too many life gain effects, but some. So maybe you can uh, figure out uh, a life gain build. So um, Will is a nice little addition uh, to reduce your casting costs. So I really like it. So I personally would give him a 7 out of 10. Um, and yeah, if you like life gain decks, so you probably can spend up to three copies uh, of Will without uh, any regret, I would say. Okay, next card is Yenna, the Red Tooth Regent. So for four mana in Celestial Colors, you get a legendary Elf Noble for four body. So this alone is nothing too spectacular, but the Yenna has a ability for two mana and you have to tap it then. You can choose target enchantment you control that doesn't have the same name as another permanent you control. Create a token that's a copy of it, except it isn't legendary. If the token is an aura, untap Yenna, Red Tooth Region, then scribe 2, activate only as a sorcery. So this card is kinda interesting because you can copy all your big enchantments if you if you don't have uh, another copy of it. Uh, onto the battlefield. So, for example, you can copy a uh, hollowed haunting, one of the virtues uh, from above. Um, for example, um, borrow time or whatever you need, um, and uh, yeah, and create a copy of it. So, a pretty cool ability from Yenna. Um, you can even create. Um, your tokens uh, of auras if you control then you can untap it and can uh yeah create uh, another aura enchantment so um it is pretty cool ability not gonna lie a pretty powerful card so you can create one um uh, create a token of one of your bigger enchantments so this is a really powerful card so kind of like it Opponent has to deal with it. Um, if you have some good um, enchantments on the battlefield, so I would rate this a eight out of ten. And if you are enchantment on aura player, definitely, yeah, you can spend two or three wild cards on this card, definitely. Okay, guys, guys. So this was my review video of the new wilds of a drain set uh, that's coming out next week um i only did it for the mystics and the rares maybe i will do uh, another video about the uh, comments and uncommons not sure about it we will see um so if you don't agree uh, uh on my opinion with one um card um i would really like to hear it in the comments if you have a, a different opinion about uh, one or two cards of the set um would really like to hear it uh, hope you did enjoy this kind of video and then i will just wish you a wonderful day and i hope you also excited about the new set coming out and then we'll see you uh, for the next video bye bye